Okay, ladies and gentlemen, good morning to all of you. Welcome to the 16th uh, annual uh, Johns Hopkins Autoimmunity Day. Um, just uh, two sentences about the purposes of uh, Autoimmunity Day. Let's say two imperatives for Autoimmunity Day. Number one, there are about 20 plus million people in the United States who have an autoimmune disease, looking at autoimmune diseases as a category of disease, which is what we do. Um, so there's an imperative there. And the other imperative is that the understanding of, uh, of immunology and of the auto and of the uh, immune response will, I think, never be complete until we understand how the body distinguishes self from non-self. So those are the two things that underlie the reason for getting together the community of investigators, uh, present and, and incoming investigators who are interested in the whole complex issue of autoimmunity and autoimmune disease. So we're going to start with something very special, uh, and that is a uh, film. So our first speaker is Dr., I should say professor now, uh, Ian Mackay. Um, Ian Mackay uh, was the main collaborator of uh, Sir McFarlane Burnett uh, particularly during the years that Burnett was developing the clonal selection theory and the, um, if you would, main exception to clonal selection, and that is autoimmunity. And uh, Ian, who was already very deeply involved in immune-mediated diseases, um, was the, the right arm of this whole program of, uh, uh, that was started by Burnett at the Hall Institute uh, in Australia that came to the uh, present understanding of how immunology works. So he was a central figure in that and remained in the field of autoimmune disease for the rest of his long career, which really extends to, to today, um, and is probably the only uh, almost complete autoimmunologist uh, in the world, the only one who has really seen the whole panoply of autoimmune disorders and who, who, who understands them all. Uh, it's been my rare privilege to work with Ian for now quite a number of years on a book uh, called The Autoimmune Diseases, a book that I think did change the world because it was the uh, the first uh, book that really brought together all of the various autoimmune disorders and focused on the common elements, the common features. So Ian is now uh, well into his 90s, um, and um, uh, a year ago we had some vague thoughts that, uh, on his part really, that he might want to come and and uh, participate and celebrate the appearance of the fifth edition of this book. Um, but uh, time has gone on, and Ian, who was the paradigm of a global, glo global trotter, uh, really wasn't up to it, and um, finally agreed to uh, do his talk on tape. So we're going to see that, uh, that tape, uh, and um, I will just explain that uh, we are starting about nine point something, about 10 minutes into the tape, uh, because some of the initial material is a sort of general discussion of immunology. And in order to fit it in the time, we're going to be starting then, and it will take until the end of the, of the, end of the hour, and then we should be back on schedule. The first 10 minutes, which you will not see, we will be showing at lunchtime, uh, because you may be interested, particularly if you're interested in the history of immunology, this is one of the men who really was there at the time, was there at the beginning. And I think just the privilege of hearing him uh, is well worth it. So I think this is also an historic document. I'm, I'm very pleased to have it. And if you have any interest, uh, stop in during lunch, and we'll show the whole tape again. <coughs> 
uh, and that particularly the first 10 minutes you'll be able to hear. Okay, that having been said, we are going to start in the sort of the beginning, but not quite the beginning of Ian Mackay's discussion of uh, autoimmune diseases, histories, and mysteries. Uh, I would like to uh, thank Dr. Noel Rose for this uh, prestigious uh, invitation to deliver as a uh, keynote speaker the uh, opening address at the 15th uh, uh, Johns Hopkins Autoimmunity Day. And I would like to draw your attention to the logo at the bottom in uh, which the motto is, is shown below and Cora Imparo translated as I am still learning. The interesting thing is that these words were written when Michelangelo was 87 years old and my hopes are that when you reach the age of 87 you will also be able to say Ancora Imparo. Take any references because uh, we've just completed a text with my colleague, a noted historian, Warwick Anderson, on the history of autoimmunity. And uh, this is due to be published in a few months. And uh, naturally, I warmly commend it to you. Immunology was an offshoot of the germ theory of disease. And the leading pioneers were from the German School of Science, Robert Koch, Emil von Behring, and Paul Ehrlich. These scientists ascertained that the blood plasma contains agents that, that neutralize bacteria and so prevent the harmful spread of diseases. A little later, Ehrlich called these antikörper, translated as antibodies. The interest in the effect of antibodies on bacteria was such that the early immunologists were naturally uh, induced to see whether antibodies formed against the tissues of an animal's own body. And indeed, they could be induced by immunization. Examples would be sperm antibodies, uh, lens antibodies, and others. The immune response did seem on occasions to have harmful effects. And since the system was obviously changed after an antigenic exposure, uh, the <clears throat> term applied was that the individual was sensitized. And if the, there was highly adverse changes, the term hypersensitivity was employed. It was found that there were two types of hypersensitivity, a one that uh, could be shown by a wheel and flare reaction after a skin challenge with antigen, and another less common, 
that took some 24 to 48 hours to develop and interestingly was not transferable to another individual by transfer of serum and its nature for a long time remained rather mysterious except that it was usually associated with infection with certain microorganisms and more particularly with, with tuberculosis. The existence of the immediate type of skin reaction and its association with immune responses caught the interest of people working in the clinic. And, and these were intrigued by the uh, reported existence of uh, severe reactions such as, such as anaphylaxis, which, which Clemens von Perkett in 1906 called allergy. When taken to the clinic, it would seem that quite a number of individuals had one or another form of, of allergy and it soon became a thriving medical specialty, especially with prospects for diagnosis by skin testing and for therapy since desensitisation procedures had been developed in London in 1910. The failure of transfer by plasma in delayed hypersensitivity was uh, intrigued the celebrated immunologist Carl Landsteiner and he conducted an experiment in which guinea pigs were sensitised to a, a chemical, picrol chloride, and lymphocytes were obtained from the animal after showing that it exhibited delayed hypersensitivity responsiveness to the chemical and somewhat to his surprise and the surprise of his co-worker Merrill Chase in 1942 there was transfer by cells of this delayed hypersensitivity reactivity uh, and during the 1950s, it was ascertained that the, there were other types of immune response that seemed likewise dependent on living cells rather than uh, on agents in the serum, antibodies in the serum. But still, uh, the, the immunologists at the time found this rather hard to swallow. And all sorts of explanations were given. A popular one was that the agent responsible was actually antibody of a far high affinity for something on the surface of lymphocytes and this so-called cell-bound antibody was responsible for delayed type hypersensitivity or DTH reactions. And this was the state of knowledge in the late 1950s and I'm going to switch back to the clinic and tell you that there was re 
awakening interest in the possibility of autoimmunization. And just to illustrate this, in I looked at the index of prominent textbooks of medicine and pathology of the 1940s, and these indexes didn't contain a single mention of autoimmunity. Yet, by the 1960s, it was becoming well known and well accepted. So, in other words, in the 1940s, it was not there, and in the 1960s, it was there uh, in the short space of some 20 years. And it's of interest to look at the reasons for this change of mind. I would look on the use of Freud's adjuvant as one of the important procedures in establishing the reality of autoimmunization. It was originally developed by Freud to enhance the effectiveness of vaccines. But when mixed with tissue emulsions and injected into animals, it accelerated the process of, of pathology very greatly. Uh, we do know that uh, a similar type of disease could be induced in monkeys because Tom Rivers had used them as controls for uh, experiments directed to a different purpose. And he did see the same thing, uh, evidence of brain disease of an encephalitis nature, but it took some 80 weeks before the disease expressed itself in the animal. So that's obviously not uh, a feasible uh, experimental procedure for, at least for most laboratories. The um, ensuing disease was called experimental allergic encephalomyelitis and the antigen responsible seemed to be associated with the myelin nerve sheath of uh, uh, cerebral axons. The second important observation in relation to autoimmunity was the fortuitous finding by Malcolm Hargraves of the Mayo Clinic of the so-called lupus erythematosus cell. It was Hargraves' uh, uh, belief that bone marrow biopsy was a very useful hematological procedure and to uh, uh, enhance that belief, he bone marrow biopsies from, from patients with various diseases. Uh, the extraordinary finding were large hematoxylin staining inclusion bodies in the neutrophils of the, uh, uh, in the bone marrow. And uh, their nature was so unusual that Hargrave was delayed some four or five years before, before publishing his short report uh, in the proceedings of the Mayo Clinic. It wasn't long before it was recognised that the LE cell formation was dependent on a serum factor and it was also soon established that that serum factor was an immunoglobulin of gamma globulin nature. Uh, then several scientific groups showed that 
what was causing LE cell formation was an anti-nuclear antibody. But by far, the uh, best work was done in Henry Kunkel's laboratory in the, um, at the Rockefeller Institute in New York between 1955-1960. And Henry Kunkel showed precisely that the target of the antibody was nuclear chromatin. So uh, he and his colleague, Hal Holman, published their findings and uh, uh, that proved, uh, proved very convincing. I saw a bit of Henry Kunkel in those days and uh, greatly admired his scientific rigour and uh, we had a lot of tennis together. Uh, he was a very competitive tennis player as well. Uh, I just hope to think that we were somewhat evenly matched. The third uh, important finding establishing the existence of autoimmunity would be the showing that a factor in, in blood in patients with rheumatoid arthritis agglutinated, sensitised red cells as though there was an antibody to gamma globulin. This was described, for, described initially by Harry Rose in New York, but going back through the literature, uh, the same effect had been shown by Eric Vala in, in Oslo, Norway, but uh, as far back as 1943, but his work was interrupted by the war and uh, it wasn't pursued thereafter. Kunkel showed that the rheumatoid factor depended on the presence of an antibody directed to the FC fragment of the IgG molecule, uh, but uh, it wasn't called anti-FC antibody. The name of rheumatoid factor was, uh, was too well entrenched. Other important observations were the application of the Coombs antiglobulin test to what was called at that time acquired hemolytic anemia, showing that these cases were actually due to an autoantibody to an antigen on the surface of erythrocytes. And uh, another important, uh, another important uh, procedures was the technical improvement in methods of uh, immunofluorescence with improvements in cryostat and imaging technology. But by far the uh, most persuasive and in fact clinching evidence were those done by uh, our Noel Rose uh, who is here with us and uh, as a junior scientist with uh, uh, Dr. Ernst Witebski, uh, f who traces his training back to the Ehrlich School in Germany. And Noel uh, showed in rabbits that immunisation with thyroglobulin would, in Freund's adjuvant, would induce an inflammatory thyroiditis by in the recipient rabbits. And the interesting fact was that the use of the 
rabbit's own thyroglobulin induced an, just as severe a reaction to uh, as uh, as thyroglobulin from other rabbits. So it was truly auto. However, I do have to say that uh, that Cabat in 1949 had uh, shown that that monkeys immunised with their own brain did develop an autoimmune encephalomyelitis. But I can remember when uh, Wateb, uh, Rose and Watebski's paper published in JAMA in 1957, uh, arrived in Melbourne. It excited Burnett tremendously. And uh, uh, I can recall him with the journal walking up and down the, uh, uh, his corridor, showing it to whoever he could uh, be in, whoever he could find to show it. He was so excited. It was perhaps something of a pity that uh, London and uh, entrepreneurial immunologist Ivan Royd had heard about uh, the Noel Rutebski work and went back and to London and, as it were, nipped in with a quick experiment in which he tested human sera from patients with Hashimoto's disease by immunoprecipitation and found very high teters. And when Warwick had an interview with uh, Ivan uh, a year or so ago, Ivan uh, was uh, rather curious as to why they hadn't done that uh, when the findings from the rabbits turned up, but the work was done in Buffalo, New York, and uh, I suppose patients with Hashimoto's disease were rather thin on the ground. Anyway, uh, the combined work established the reality of uh, autoimmune disease. At the same time, in collaboration with uh, Carlton, uh, Carlton Gadishek, we used an, a complement fixation reaction with crude extracts of, of liver cells and showed there were complement fixa fixing antibodies at high levels in an unusual type of chronic active hepatitis I was interested in at the time and also primary biliary cirrhosis and we deduced that these also may be autoimmune diseases. The interest that Burnett developed resulted in a somewhat close association I had with him at the Hall Institute in the late 1950s. And I certainly learned a lot of immunological theory from him in our exchanges and I think he rather uh, enjoyed being taught something about clinical autoimmunity uh, as judged by the patients I was seeing in the war. The interest uh, was augmented when Burnett received an invitation from Charles C. Thomas, Thomas Publishers in, uh, 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 in the United States to write a book on autoimmunity. And uh, so he uh, called me into his office, showed me the invitation and said, uh, uh, I wondered if you'd like to uh, try doing this book. Uh, it's a good way of advancing your scientific career to write a book.
I was hardly in a position to refuse. And in 1960, I set about writing this. It was finally done after a couple of years' work and sent off and published in 1963. Uh, I can remember Burnett's reaction as he turned the pages of the first email copy that arrived in Melbourne, Australia, and uh, looked at me rather dryly and said, uh, uh, rather a bit too clinical, don't you think? Uh, I was a little downcast because at that time it was a very, uh, uh, autoimmunity was a very clinical affair. But uh, the publishers certainly were uh, quite excited by the response and I had demands for a second edition. Noel Rose visited the Hall Institute uh, as a sabbatical visitor and uh, uh, we agreed to uh, jointly edit a book on autoimmunity and that has just reached its uh, fifth edition and uh, has been uh, out from the publishers just three or four months. I'll return at this point to uh, the laboratory uh, around 1960 and the problem of cellular immunology. Uh, a young Australian medical graduate, Jacques Miller, decided that he didn't really enjoy seeing patients and wanted to have a research career and obtained a scholarship at the Chester Beatty Hospital in London. And when uh, he discussed his, uh, his projects. He was advised that uh, investigation of the origin of mouse leukaemia in a particular strain of mice might be an interesting thing to tackle. And he did that and to uh, prove the point that the virus was responsible for the leukaemia, he developed a delicate technique of neonatal thymectomy. The experiment worked to the extent that the mice failed to get uh, leukaemia, but after some months they developed a peculiar wasting disease, uh, were excessively prone to particular infections, and when tested with allografts, showed an inability to reject allografts, all, all properties associated with defects of cellular immunity, which uh, had proved so mysterious up to date. And as a result of his researches, on the thymus, Jacques Miller deduced that the function of the thymus, of the thymus previously unknown, was to serve as the source of cells that uh, were responsible for cell-mediated immunity. A uh, very striking finding. Uh, at the same time, and I had don't have time to uh, give the details. A corresponding finding was made that in birds by ornithologists at the University of Mississippi in the United States, that there existed an organ close to the lower rectum called the bursa of Fabricius, which when removed left the chickens with an inability 
to make antibodies to certain bacterial infections. The, <clears throat> so there seem to exist two cell systems. A cell system for the mediation of cell mediated, cell mediated immunology and uh, cell mediated immune responses and uh, humoral immunity with an impaired resistance to bacterial infections. Jacques Miller's uh, associate Graham Mitchell uh, with a sense of anguish regretted that he didn't think of the names of T and B. That in fact was uh, uh, established by Ivan Reut, mentioned earlier, and um, <laughs> uh, on talking to Ivan, he said, well, uh, it happened while I was lying in bed, convalescing from a severe attack of flu, that I thought up that paper, which proved immensely influential and established the T and B cell paradigm, which uh, has uh, governed latter-day immunology. Um, in speaking about our, our book of 1963, it's uh, a long time back, uh, some 50 years, but there are parts that are still contemporary. Um, for example, I looked at uh, the markers of autoimmune disease. The presence of autoantibodies uh, had the highest requirement and um, I'll just like to summarise what one finds in healthy people. There are no autoantibodies, except perhaps with age, when uh, a few uh, a few specificities turn up. Uh, there are organ-specific diseases: thyroiditis, gastritis. Uh, autoimmune diabetes and others, in which there are accompanying autoantibodies which are congruent with the disease in question. That is, thyroiditis uh, uh, is marked by antithyroid antibodies, gastritis by uh, antiparietal cell antibodies, etc. The systemic rheumatic diseases uh, have various autoantibody reactions, and uh, but not to any one particular antibody specificity. And um, there are another group of diseases in which antibody reactions are not present, yet the histopathology and other features simulate those of autoimmune disease. And we are not really sure how to correctly classify such diseases. Um, some people refer, might refer to them as auto-inflammatory, meaning there are uh, harmful cytokines elicited without uh, any obvious autoantigenic stimulation. Stoffels and Simon in uh, uh, the fifth edition just published of autoimmune diseases by Noel Rose and myself, uh, tried to get round this by postulating a, a spectrum from autoimmune to autoinflammatory, 
with uh, mixed pattern diseases such as spondylitis, psoriasis, partly autoimmune, partly anti-inflammatory, and, uh, and also uh, uh, inflammatory bowel diseases. And finally, the pure as, uh, auto anti-inflammatory as originally described, such as familial Mediterranean fever. But uh, somehow, I'm just not sure that this gets round our problem. Anyway, passing on from the 1960s to the 1970s, the uh, next surprise in autoimmunology was the finding from a uh, somewhat iconoclastic scientist, Yale, a Richard Gershon. I knew Gershon because he, one of his interests was in chronic hepatitis, although not the sort that uh, I'd been working on. And um, Gershon described what he called infectious tolerance. Uh, he tolerized mice to a um, particular antigen and then infused uh, spleen cells to the recipient who, and in the process, he transferred an unresponsive state. He originally called this infectious tolerance, but later referred to the T cells being responsible from the donor, and um, he called them suppressor T cells. Well, in some ways, suppressor T cells were just what the uh, immunological community was wishing for, and um, it they uh, soon became quite an industry, the experiments on suppressor T cells. Um, I can recall the uh, data purporting to show that there existed uh, contra suppressor T cells, suppressor inducer cells and so forth. But um, after about 10 years, the uh, immunological community started to become a little uneasy because there was uh, no evident cell marker that distinguished a suppressor cell from other lymphocytes and there was no demonstrable gene locus that encoded the capacity for a cells to act, for T cells to act as suppressors. And so interest gradually faded. But um, there was one researcher, an immunology laboratory in Kyoto, Japan, Dr. Shimon Sakaguchi, who uh, kept faith. And Sakaguchi recalled that there were experiments in which adult animals had been thymus deprived in one way or another and this seemed to be associated with, uh, with autoimmunity. And so he developed neonatal thymectomy in a particular strain, a, seemed a promising strain from earlier experimental work, uh, Balb C in which he performed perinatal thymectomy and indeed uh, the uh, experimental mice did develop a range of um, autoimmune pathologies. In fact, uh, it's by far the best way of inducing a model of experimental autoimmune gastritis and used extensively for that purpose and uh, has uh, allowed investigators to identify the relevant uh, parietal cell autoantigens and uh, 
the uh, uh, determining epitopes. Sakaguchi's suppressor cells didn't suffer the same fate as Richard Gershon's suppressor cells. Uh, there were markers could be used to identify the population, such as uh, the uh, surface antigen CD25, and also they were characterised by a su suppressor cell specific uh, transcription factor, FOXP3. And uh, uh, to my mind, uh, the uh, role of latter-day suppressor T cells is uh, likely to continue to be a very important one. I have to add that uh, uh, the uh, untimely fate of uh, the Gershon CD8 positive suppressor cell uh, uh, led to Sakaguchi finding a new name. They were called regulatory T cells and now are known to everybody as T regs. Uh, we'll move on to some of the uh, mysteries of autoimmunity. And the first and always of interest to people in the clinic is what causes an autoimmune disease. I've always been rather intrigued by the paper published by Kenneth Rothman in 1976 in the American Journal of Epidemiology. And he nominated causes which he divided into component causes, sufficient causes and necessary causes. Uh, his diagram shows three different sets of component causes. For, for many complex diseases there would be probably many, many uh, component causes identifiable. Groups of these could be identified that resulted in the disease in question and these were known as sufficient causes. Three different sufficient causes are shown in the diagram. Uh, now you'll notice in all of them the common uh, component cause is A, which appears in every sufficient cause, and that is then defined as a necessary cause, because without that cause, the disease does not develop. I've tried to adapt this causal argument to the occurrence of autoimmune disease, but I'm afraid to say not particularly successfully because uh, uh, I think autoimmunity may be uh, too, com too complex for uh, the, uh, this type of approach. The next mystery, it's not really a mystery, but uh, it's a source of amazement has been the development of neuroimmunology and the susceptibility of the central nervous system to a whole variety of curious uh, chronic neurological disorders. Uh, the uh, diagram was given to me by Dr. Van der Lennon at the mayor, uh, who's the head of the uh, neuroimmunology laboratory at the Mayo Clinic. And it's, illustrate, it's interesting that it illustrates the tremendous growth in test requests. Uh, Van der Lennon tells me that they get about 600 
a day and by the end of 2014 they may be doing a million tests a year for autoimmune neurological diseases which uh, in, include in particular um, various paraneoplastic CNS diseases. These are diseases that are expressed in the central nervous system but are due to a peripheral tumour of the uh, ovary, lung, breast and so forth. And there are various targets. One particular target and the patients I've seen is uh, the Purkinje cells of the cerebellum resulting in severe ataxia. The um, antigens that provoke these are presumably antigens of the tumour that um, have homology with antigens of brain cells and uh, uh, the one we've studied in particular is, um, is glutamic acid decarboxylase uh, isoform 65. The targets of the immune response are rather variable uh, but seem mainly to be uh, neuronal transmitter molecules of one type or another and the diseases that uh, van der Lennen's laboratory looks at are uh, uh, of course stiff man syndrome or stiff person syndrome uh, epilepsy uh, dementia early dementia uh, encephalopathy and various others and uh, uh, I think that uh, these uh, uh, these cerebral diseases due to neuronal anti-brain activity have uh, a lot of promise in the understanding of autoimmune disease. Perhaps the most mysterious to me is uh, the disease narcolepsy which is um, an irresistible desire to sleep during the uh, during waking hours and um, that is now being attributed to an autoimmune response to a hypothalamic protein hypocretin uh, and it is of interest that narcolepsy has an extreme HLA bias to a particular MHC type and the other telling bits of evidence are that it, there seems to be an in Increase in cases, although it, overall it's a very rare disease, in um, uh, association with bouts of uh, H1N1 influenza and even influenza vaccination. And uh, uh, what, from what little is known of background to the disease, the uh, uh, there is a profound loss of hypocretin secreting cells in uh, the hypothalamus. A recent paper of interest describes T cell reactivity to a target that's been constructed of a cell line that expresses the particular HLA type together with hypocretin uh, peptides and um, that cell line can be used as a target for reactivity.
by CD4, by CD4 T cells. The next somewhat mysterious disease I'd like to mention is um, uh, celiac disease. Celiac disease has gone by many names, uh, sprue, non-tropical sprue, idiopathic steatorrhea, gluten enteropathy, but it seems that uh, the medical community has settled on, on celiac disease, a name conferred by Samuel G. in many years ago. Uh, I was having a, we were, uh, uh, Warwick Anderson and I were asked to publish an editorial type article on, on celiac disease and we had quite a vigorous debate on when it was first suggested that this might be uh, an autoimmune disease and um, it was not resolved uh, but I find with some interest that in going through some uh, old papers of mine, I found one, uh, a report of some work I did in the 1950s that I'd for completely forgotten about. And things are bad when you start forgetting what papers you've written <laughs> earlier on in your life. Anyway, uh, this paper uh, concerned the this paper concerned the uh, effects of uh, of corticosteroid drugs on the absorption of proteins, fat and calcium in idiopathic steatorrhea. It was published in Gastroenterology in 1955. Uh, it fulfilled one of the markers that I mentioned earlier of re responsiveness to corticosteroids, but the paper has been long forgotten because uh, there are other preferable methods of treatment than use of corticosteroids, which would need to be continued lifelong. Run through some of the key features of this disease, which is basically due to gluten proteins in the food and the uh, whole story is quite an quite an interesting one that um, there isn't time to um, uh, share with you but the essence is that um, certain gluten fragments survive digestion in the uh, gut and these uh, uh, glidens are rich in proline and glutamine. Now that isn't sufficient because these glutamine containing residues need to be deaminated before they become biologically active as disease agents. And this is effective by, uh, uh, affected by a mucosal enzyme, tissue transglutaminase. The deaminated peptides then become uh, joined with uh, particular HLA-DQ alleles, HLA-DQ more particularly, and HLA-DQB8. And as a result of that, there is release of injurious cytokines and uh, extensive damage and for uh, those with a, a 
some histological knowledge. The small bowel mucosa normally has long finger-like processes called villi, which are completely flattened, and you can see the cellular infiltration in the intestine. Now, one of the features not mentioned on the slide, but of tremendous importance is, uh, diagnostically, is the fact that there are antibodies in serum uh, originally described as uh, by immunofluorescence. The reason why tissue transglutaminase autoimmunity or an autoimmune reaction to tissue transglutaminase uh, exists in this disease seems to me quite mysterious and unexplained and uh, uh, because uh, it's not needed for the uh, uh, toxic effect of the gluten peptides. I'll finish with uh, a, an area that I think is going to be of ever increasing importance for immunology and that's the role of diet and gut homeostasis uh, in various diseases. This is the role of dietary fibre which uh, is uh, degraded by commensal microorganisms in the intestine and it seems that diets high in fibre have a favourable effect on the uh, microbiota of the gut, whereas Western-style diets uh, have a uh, illicit, a different microbiota, which are less favourable. And the reason is that the high fibre microbiota is uh, responsible for the production of a, an important diet sensing a microbiota that is produces high levels of short chain fatty acids and uh, this is not shown on the diagram, but uh, the short-chain fatty acids uh, react with receptors uh, identified uh, by a close relative of mine, Charles Mackay, as GPR43. And GPR43 on uh, engagement of uh, the ligand short uh, chain fatty acids uh, has a modul modulatory effect on immune inflammation and uh, I'll leave it at that and thank you for your kind attention. Thank you very much. We, we imported an expert just for that purpose. So um, we're going to, as I said, um, replay the entire tape. Uh, starting in lunch, if you'd like to see particularly the first 10 or 12 minutes that we omitted here, which gives a lot of the early history of immunology, but wasn't directly on the target. So I think this was a, a real treat, certainly for me, to hear this from uh, somebody who was there at the beginning and uh, really set the pace for autoimmune disease research from the, from the beginning and probably is the the uh, last uh, um, ecumenical autoimmunologist. So we're going on with our regular program, and I'm going to turn the chair over to our uh, moderator of the morning, Patrizio Cateregli. Thank you, Dr. Rosa. I also welcome everybody to this uh, another edition of the Autoimmunity Day. It was a really wonderful excursion of the history of uh, 
immunology, you saw many different diseases from thyroiditis, gastritis, uh, celiac disease, and also I hope you understand that uh, many of them share a lot of commonalities, especially from the pathological point of view. Just a funny note, uh, we say in Italian, we say imparo ancora, and <laughs> not as he said. So it's one of the few occasions where uh, I can say you have an accent. So he had a strong accent in saying the Michelangelo's word. <laughs> All right, so I will be very happy to introduce the first speaker of the morning, Dr. Erika Daras. She's a junior faculty in the Department of Medicine and will tell us about her work in rheumatoid arthritis and enzyme activity antibodies. Thank you, and I wanna thank Dr. Rose and the organizers for giving me the opportunity to speak to you today. I'm excited to tell you about our work. So I'm gonna start by giving you a brief introduction to rheumatoid arthritis, or RA as I'll refer to it. It is a systemic autoimmune disease characterized by pain, swelling, and inflammation, predominantly of the small joints of the hands and feet, as you can see on the top left um, with the swollen joints. Um, all the players of a normal immune response are present at this site. So you have T and B cells infiltrating this, the joint lining or the synovial tissue. In the synovial, synovial fluid, in the joint fluid, you have an impressive infiltrate of neutrophils. They're the predominant cell type, as well as monocytes. You have lots of autoantibodies present, predominantly IgGs and complement, so, and lots of pro-inflammatory cytokines. And so all of this pro-inflammatory milieu leads to destruction of the bone, the cartilage, a lot of proliferative changes in the joint space that can ultimately lead to destruction of the joint and disability as shown on the bottom left. And so on the right here is a schematic of how we think about how the immune system evolves in rheumatoid arthritis. We know that there is a prolonged asymptomatic phase shown on top where we think the disease initiates. We know that at this point, the patient experiences no symptoms. They don't know that they have the disease. They don't know that they're going to get the disease, yet they have evidence of autoimmunity to self-proteins as marked by high titer, class-switched autoantibodies against a very specific group of self-proteins, which I'll tell you a lot more about. And so at this stage, we think that susceptibility genes in RA, it's really a specific group of MHC class II alleles called the shared epitope alleles that conspire with environmental factors. Really, infection and smoking have been the things most implicated in conspiring with these susceptibility genes to initiate autoimmunity to these self-proteins that I'll tell you about. And so at this phase of transition, we know that this is marked by epitope spreading. So Autoantibodies appear that recognize multiple different self-autoantigen targets, different epitopes on those targets. The um, pro-inflammatory cytokine levels increase, and at some point, the disease tips to overt clinical disease. And so at this point, for reasons that we still don't understand, the disease transitions to where the target tissue is actually being damaged by the immune system in this down, um, lower panel, this propagative phase of disease. So you have damage of the target tissue of the joints, you have release of autoantigen, which is recruiting more inflammatory cells, which is damaging more tissue, and this is a propagative phase of disease that really won't stop um, unless there's intervention therapeutically. And I will say that even though RA we think of as dominantly being attack of the joints. It is a systemic autoimmune disease, so you have systemic features of inflammation, and other tissues can be targeted, including the lung, vessels, and the skin, and so I'll touch on that a little bit more later. And I wanted to point out, um, which was really outlined very nicely in Dr. Mackay's talk, that autoantibodies, we think, play a major role in autoimmunity in general. They mark the diseases. They help diagnose these diseases. We think they're playing a role. But unlike organ-specific autoimmune disease, there's a much less clear role for autoantibodies in systemic autoimmunity. They're incredibly useful diagnostically. They're highly specific for the diseases that they're found in. But what they're actually doing to propagate disease forward is unclear. We know immune complex deposition is a major feature of systemic autoimmunity, but whether an antibody binding to the antigen is mediating a direct effect is unclear. So unlike organ-specific autoimmunity on the left, 
We have an expert in the room on myasthenia gravis, Dr. Drachman. Um, this is a disease where autoantibodies binding to the acetylcholine receptor at the neuromuscular junction mediate direct effects and cause muscle weakness, as shown by the drooping eyelid up top. Um, here is a disease, pemphigus vulgaris, in which antibodies to the um, junction between epithelial cells, antibody binding to that area disrupts the way that epithelial cells interact and causes a blistering autoimmune disease. So in these organ-specific cases, autoantibody binding to the target mediates a direct effect that results in pathology. It's less clear, like I mentioned, in systemic autoimmunity what, if the antibodies are playing an active direct role. And so as I mentioned, in rheumatoid arthritis, there are autoantibodies to a very specific group of self-proteins. Um, we know about rheumatoid factor. A lot of patients have antibodies that bind to FC portions of other antibodies, which we actually heard in the last talk. But the new kid on the block is this family of autoantibodies present in about 80% of patients with rheumatoid arthritis that target a very specific post-translational modification called citrullination. And so patients with these antibodies to citrullinated proteins or anti-CCP antibodies, that's the clinical test, um, these patients tend to have more severe disease. They have these genetic factors that I mentioned. A lot of them have a history of exposure to smoking. Um, and these antibodies are highly specific for RA. They're predictive of the disease. They're present in that prolonged asymptomatic phase I mentioned. And they're useful diagnostically in saying, yes, this patient has RA. If they have these antibodies, they likely have RA. And so in the bottom left corner shows the modification, which has gained a lot more attention now that we know it's a target of antibodies in RA. And you can see um, positively charged arginine residues are converted into neutrally charged citrulline residues through the activity of the peptidyl arginine deaminase enzymes, or PAD enzymes. And these enzymes, as I mentioned, really were not widely studied up until it was appreciated that the products of this reaction actually were targeted in an autoimmune disease. And it's um, a family of enzymes comprised of five family members with wide tissue expression. They all citrullinate proteins. They all carry out that modification. And they're, they serve normal roles in tif uh, tissue differentiation, gene expression. So it's a normal process that, for some reason, an RA is targeted by the immune system. And specifically, in rheumatoid arthritis, there are three enzymes that have gained a lot of attention. PAD4, show down here, shown here on the right. PAD2 on the upper left, and just recently PAD3, all of which are expressed in neutrophils. And that's why they've sort of, one reason why they've gained a lot of attention is they're expressed in neutrophils, and neutrophils are their predominant cell type in the inflamed joint. Also, PADs 2 and 4 have been shown to be expressed at high levels in the actual scene of the crime, in, in the inflamed RA joint. And so you can see there's some immunohistochemistry of different biopsies from patients with rheumatoid arthritis, um, synovial lining. And you can see there's PAD2 and PAD4 expressed at that site. And they're expressed, the enzymes are in the same place where the citrullinated proteins are expressed. And so you have the product of the reaction, the target of the immune system, and the enzyme generating that product at the scene of the crime in RA. But what our lab and others found a few years ago is not only are the products of the reaction targeted in 80% of patients with RA, the CCP um, antibodies, half of those people also target the enzyme. Half of those people target the peptidyl arginine deaminase 4 protein itself. And so patients with antibodies to PAD4 have a more severe disease course, as shown at the bottom. They have higher SHARP scores. And SHARP score is a radiographic measure of the damage of the bones in the hands and the feet. And you can see in the x-ray that little chip out of the bone here. Um, I can try to show you. Uh, I'm sure you can see it. But here um, is an erosion. So that's a place where the immune system has destroyed the bone. And so to calculate a sharp score, they look for those eros erosive changes in multiple joints of the hands and feet, calculate a cumulative score. The higher the score, the more erosive and severe the disease is. And as you can see on the bottom, patients with antibodies to PAD4 have more severe disease. Other groups found that not only is it more severe, but it's harder to treat. So these people with these antibodies tend to progress more in their disease, erode their bones more aggressively, despite being treated with the standard therapies for rheumatoid arthritis.
So we didn't want to stop there. We knew that there were other PAD enzymes expressed in neutrophils, like I mentioned. PADs 2 and PAD3 were also expressed in neutrophils. So we asked a really innocent question. We knew patients had antibodies to PAD4. Do they have antibodies to these other family members? And when we looked um, at the bottom, that's just a snapshot of the data, you can see on the top, this was an immunoprecipitation reaction where we labeled the antigen with S35. It was radio-labeled. We mixed it with the serum from a patient, did an immunoprecipitation, and pulled that down. So anywhere you see a band means the patient had autoantibodies to that protein. And so up top, we find patients who have antibodies to PAD4, as we knew. This had been known. On the bottom, we really didn't find anybody who had antibodies to PAD2. It was less than 1%, and we screened over 200 patients. Less than 1% had antibodies to PAD2, and when we found them, they were very low titer. But what shocked us is we saw patients in the middle panel there who had antibodies to PAD3. And in every case, when we saw antibodies to PAD3, they also had antibodies to PAD4, in every case, you can see. And rarely in science are things so cut and dry, so we thought this must be a cross-reactive antibody. It must be that the same antibody is binding to some shared epitope, some shared sequence on the two proteins. And in blocking experiments that I'm not going to show you, we confirmed that indeed these really were cross-reactive antibodies. Some patients with PAD4 antibodies ha recognized a portion of the molecule that was shared by PAD3. So I'll refer to them as cross-reactive antibodies for the rest of the talk. So we wanted to understand a little bit more about these antibodies, if there were any clinical associations. And so we screened 200 patients in the ESCAPE RA co cohort. This was the cohort that initially was used to define PAD4 antibodies as a whole. We used this, these group of patients to identify those antibodies. And you can see that um, patients in the ESCAPE cohort who were negative for PAD4 antibodies, none of them had this new antibody specificity. In patients that had PAD4 antibodies, half of them were negative for the new specificity, kind of like this person. They recognize PAD4, but they don't recognize PAD3, this group. And the other half recognized both antigens. They seem to have this cross-reactive property. And since we knew there were clinical associations with the PAD4 antibody group as a whole, we wanted to know if we just look at this subgroup that has this cross-reactive property, can we find any interesting clinical associations? And when we looked, we found that when we looked at disease, again, this is the SHARP score, the disease erosion score, looking at patients broken up down into these three antibody categories, we find that patients with these cross-reactive antibodies have by far the most erosive, severe joint disease. And really, if patients who just recognize PAD4 now didn't really have very severe disease. So it really was driven by this cross-reactive group. We also found that this group was most likely to progress in their disease over the course of a year. So they continued to erode their bones despite being treated equally to the other groups. So these patients were treated with the same amount of methotrexate. They were on steroids at the same rate. They were given TNF-alpha inhibitors to the same degree that the other groups were, yet they continued to do the worst. So we identified a, a subgroup of a subgroup. So now we identified patients with antibodies that cross-reacted between PAD3 and PAD4. They were a subset of this previously defined group. And kind of those, those features that were identified in this group really seemed to segregate with the cross-reactive antibody group. They had the most severe disease. They seemed to be resistant to treatment. So we wondered now that we had kind of an, an enriched group with really the most severe disease, could we find some new associations that we couldn't find before? And something really shocking jumped out. The ESCAPE RA cohort was comprised initially to look at cardiovascular outcomes, and so high-resolution chest uh, CT scans were performed on everyone. And as part of that, they looked at the heart, but they also looked at the lung. And what I rem remember I told you that um, RA is a systemic autoimmune disease, so you can have a f um, other organs affected. And what we found was patients who have the cross-reactive antibodies were at the highest risk of having lung involvement. So these patients were at the highest risk for having interstitial lung disease, which is infiltration um, of the lung by, uh, non-specifically by inflammatory cells, or you can see fibrotic changes in the lung. So patients with the cross-reactive antibodies were at the highest risk for having um, disease in their lung as well, compared to the other groups. 
And this is a quite striking effect. You see 68% of people with these antibodies have evidence of lung disease. And we knew that um, RA-associated ILD, interstitial lung disease, is the most common type of lung disease that a patient with RA can experience. It's diagnosed in about 10 to 25% of people with rheumatoid arthritis. And even if an unbiased approach is taken, and so all patients with RA are screened like they were in ESCAPE, the ESCAPE cohort, you can find lung changes in about 60% of people with RA, even if they don't know they have any symptoms. If you look in the lung, you can find evidence that they're affected. And the biggest risk factor for getting lung involvement is actually smoking, as you could imagine. So we wanted to understand if there were any effects between uh, the antibody and the smoking status. And here we were really shocked. We, if when we broke patients down into smoking status and antibody status, we find that in patients who had these cross-reactive antibodies and smoked, 93% of them had lung inflammation on x-ray. So it really seemed to put people at risk, people who had the antibody and were smokers. There was something about that, that they interact, those factors interacted to cause development of lung disease. You can see in patients who had the antibody or were smokers, their risk was slightly elevated, but not nearly as high. So there was definitely some additive effect that we still don't understand. We're actively trying to pursue this because I find this fascinating. Um, so that's sort of where we are uh, with this story. Uh, we think we really identified a lab test or a biomarker that allows us to pick out those RA patients who have the worst joint disease and also the worst lung disease, um, which I think can be pretty informative, hopefully, clinically. But beyond that, we wanted to understand why. It really suggested that maybe this antibody was actually doing something to drive the disease forward. So unlike a lot of autoantibodies and systemic autoimmunity, maybe it was actually participating actively in driving the disease forward. And so we wanted to explore some of the biochemical properties of these antibodies, how they could modulate potentially the function of the enzyme. And it's so attractive to think that we think this enzyme is really important in RA pathogenesis. It generates almost as a fuel pump, generates the fuel, the citrullinated protein that seems to be the fire that keeps RA going. So it's so attractive to think that an autoantibody binding to the fuel pump, binding to PAD, could turn it on contribute to disease activity, and that's why these people have worse disease. And so we were not the only people to think that this was a really attractive hypothesis. Two other groups looked at the effect of PAD4 autoantibodies on the enzyme. And this is before it was known about that cross-reactive subset that we identified. And so looking at the group as a whole, it was really ambiguous. So looking at a small molecule and then adding antibodies, there was really no effect of the antibody on PAD activity when you looked at a small molecule. Another group looked at a big molecule, fibrinogen, which is a known target of the anti-CCP antibodies, found that some antibodies inhibited, or, um, inhibited PAD activity, some enhanced PAD activity modestly, just a 1.5-fold change. So it was still very unclear. So when we started thinking about this problem, we, didn't wa we wanted to think about it a little bit differently. And we know that PAD4 and all the PAD enzymes are exquisitely sensitive to calcium for their activation. They need to bind calcium to become active. And this is really evident by the crystal structure. So this is the calcium-free crystal structure of PAD4. You see there are a lot of red acidic residues on the surface. When calcium binds in this region, there are two calcium ions that bind. Causes some pretty dramatic conformational changes here and formation of the active site cleft. So this little pocket is where the, small mo where's, where the um, protein substrate enters and is citrullinated. And this is just shown um, co-crystal with BAEE, the, very, the small molecule that really only requires interaction with that site to be modified. But calcium binding elsewhere does some other things. And so there are three calcium ions that bind in this region. And you can see there are also dramatic changes here. The formation of this horn, as I call it, it's actually uh, stabilizing an alpha helix that's formed there by calcium ions and forms this horn. And that was hypothesized to be involved in protein-protein interactions, but still, even it's not completely clear what it's doing. But we really thought, since PAD4 is so well sensitive to calcium binding, maybe if we think about calcium as a variable when we do these studies, we'll find something interesting. And the other aspect that was really puzzling in the field is that in a test tube, PAD4 required really high levels of calcium for activity, 5 to 10 millimolar. But we know that in vivo, it's active 
We know that it serves a role. It's normally active with much less calcium. So in cells, even with cellular activity, um, the maximum intracellular calcium concentration that you really find is 100 micromolar. Maybe the local concentrations could be a little bit higher, but certainly not 5 to 10. And even extracellularly, PAD4 is known to escape the cell and be present extracellularly as well. Even in plasma and synovial fluid, you don't really see levels over 1.5 millimolar. So there's sort of this conundrum that suggested that potentially in vivo, PAD4 is actually regulated. Its sensitivity to calcium may actually be regulated by binding partners. This is not known, it's still not known, but it was suggesting that something was different in cells versus a test tube with purified components. And so with all of this in mind, we designed some calcium titration experiments. So in the absence of antibody, we took a set amount of PAD4, a set amount of substrate, in this case histone H3, it's a known PAD4 substrate, and looked at citrullination with a anti-citrullinated histone specific antibody. So it only binds to histone when it's citrullinated, and you'll see a signal. And so as we titrated the amount of calcium, you can see that PAD4 was only really active at 5 to 10 millimolar, as we knew. You see citrullination here. And it pretty rapidly drops off if you get into this more physiologic range of calcium concentrations. If you use an antibody from a patient that only has um, antibodies to PAD4, it doesn't have this cross-reactive property, you can see it's very similar. It's slightly extended. The enzyme's slightly better functioning, but not that much. If you add IgG from a patient who has these cross-reactive antibodies associated with worse disease, all of a sudden you can see that the enzyme is able to be active over an extended range of calcium concentrations all the way down into this more physiologic range. So 200 micromolar calcium. And when we compare fold chains, so activity of PAD here versus here, we can see at these lower calcium concentrations, PAD4 is four to 500 times more active. So it's able to citrullinate just fine at these low calcium concentrations when the antibody's around. So we wanted to understand a little bit more about how this is happening, where the antibody's binding, what's it actually doing. Um, and we replicated the experiments by the other group with the small molecule BAEE. And we found that these cross-reactive antibodies had no effect on the citrullination of a small molecule. That sm small molecule goes into the active site and goes out. It doesn't require interaction anywhere else on the protein. And so we thought that suggested to us that the antibody wasn't affecting formation of the active site cleft. It wasn't really playing a role up in that portion of the molecule, but there was that other part, the formation of that horn involved in protein-protein interactions. We thought maybe the antibody's binding there. So to understand exactly what was going on, we took the data here that we saw. We quantified the citrullination here and plotted it versus um, the citrullination we saw versus calcium concentration. And what we saw is in the absence of an, the antibody with PAD4 alone, or with antibodies to, I'm sorry, with, yeah, PAD4 alone, or antibodies just to PAD4 that didn't have the cross-reactive capability, the curve is very sigmoidal. And you can see that's very reminiscent of how hemoglobin binds to oxygen, the sigmoidal shape, suggesting there's positive cooperativity. So PAD4 binding to one calcium ion allows, allows it to bind the next, then the next, then the next. So that's cooperative calcium binding. PAD4 exhibits that property. So without any antibody around, um, PAD4 needs about four calcium ions to be active. It needs to bind four. When we add antibodies that have this cross-reactive property, the line becomes a lot more logarithmic, a lot more like myoglobin, which only binds one oxygen atom, a lot more sigmoidal. So it's less cooperative. You don't really see that effect of one calcium helps the next helps the next. You don't need as much calcium to bind. And you see that here. The Hill coefficient, which is a measure of how many ions are actually binding, goes from four or five to two. So in the presence of the antibody, the enzyme doesn't need as much calcium. It doesn't need to bind as much. Suggesting to us that maybe the antibody is actually substituting for some calcium, so you don't need it, and you, it's able to be functional at much lower calcium concentrations, potentially in the joint of a patient with RA. And so just to confirm sort of the location of the antibody binding, we did some blocking studies. We took advantage of some knowledge in the lab from another project, which is that PAD4 is cleaved by the protease granzyme B at a single site, at this aspartic acid 388, which cleaves the molecule in half. 
Aspartic acid 388 is also really important in binding to this calcium ion 4. And so what we found is in the absence of antibody or in the presence of antibodies that just pound to pad 4 but didn't have the cross-reactive property, we could see that the antibodies likely bind elsewhere. The protein is susceptible to cleavage by granzyme B. So this site is exposed. Granzyme B can cleave it in half. But in the presence of antibodies that have the cross-reactive property, the protein is now protected from proteolysis. You see intact protein here at a higher level, suggesting that the antibodies binding in this region, protecting the, prote the proteolytic site from granzyme B now can't get access to that site. Um, it's protected from proteolysis and remains intact, even with the enzyme around, suggesting that it really is binding, the antibody is binding in that region. And this is the region that, where that horn is formed. So what we think is happening is that these antibodies bind to the enzyme in this region, stabilize a structure that's normally stabilized by calcium binding, allowing the enzyme to be turned on and functional at lower calcium concentrations that are present in vivo, potentially being the reason why th these patients with this antibody have more severe disease. Their enzyme's turned on. It's ramped up. And so I just wanted to show you this cartoon, how I've started to think about these cross-reactive antibodies sort of hiding within the larger PAD4 antibody pool. If you're a patient who has PAD4 antibodies and you don't have this cross-reactive property, your disease is less severe, your disease is more mild, you still have RA, but you're not destroying your bones at the same rate. If you have this cross-reactive subset tucked away within your PAD4 antibody pool or a wolf in sheep's clothing, it, it's hiding in the PAD4 antibody pool, but it actually may have pathogenic potential. These antibodies are able to bind to the enzyme, bind to the fuel pump, turn it on, and inject more fuel into the system. And so I think what I'm starting to appreciate is that epitope matters. You know, it's not just that the antibodies bind to the antigen, it's actually where they're binding to the antigen and how they're interacting with that protein that may really affect um, its pathogenic potential. And I think we might take this model and apply it to other diseases where we think the antibodies aren't doing anything and maybe we can actually find pathogenic subsets within the pool. And I just wanted to end by showing this data which is showing that the PAD4 enzyme, if we're able to turn that enzyme off, especially in these people that seem to have hyperactive PAD enzyme, we may have some therapeutic benefit in patients with RA. So this is a mouse, a collagen-induced arthritis mouse model. And you can see the mice, um, when injected with collagen, they develop arthritis. This is their disease activity score develop arthritis, when they're given an inhibitor for these PAD enzymes, their disease is less active. So this is kind of being really, there's a lot of interest in applying these inhibitors to patients. So I just wanted to thank everyone who was involved in these studies. I want to thank my longtime mentor, Anthony Rosen, um, other people who've really contributed great ideas in the Division of Rheumatology, Felipe Andrade, John Giles and Joan Bathon compiled the ESCAPE RA cohort, and John Giles did all the statistics on those patients. Um, Herb Bull was a retired enzymologist from Merck who kind of briefly came out of retirement to help us learn about the Michaelis-Menten equation and the Hill coefficient and help us design the experiments where we could actually get some information. Um, and so I just wanted to thank the Arthritis Center for helping us gain access to patient samples and our funding sources, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Yes. So that's uh, beautiful work. Thank you. Um, tell me a little bit about the granzyme B. Of course, Anthony uh, believes that, that uh, proteins that are uh, susceptible to being cleaved by mm -hmm. granzyme Right. So we knew f we were actually exploring that exact question in the lab which with PAD4, which is why we knew it was cleaved. We knew where it was cleaved. For this purpose, we used it just as a tool to try to prove where the epitope or the antibody was binding. But what we found is in the presence of these antibodies, the protein is actually protected from cleavage by granzyme B. So it's a little bit maybe counter to 
the hypothesis in the lab, although we think that granzyme B actually sel initially selects proteins as antigens by breaking tolerance to them initially. So potentially that would be a really early step that would happen. We know granzyme B levels are increased in synovial fluid from patients, and patients with higher levels of granzyme B have higher disease activity levels. So potentially really early on in disease, granzyme B cleaving pad 4 does liberate new epitopes, kind of gets the immune system started, then you get antibodies generated and all of that, which then come back and combined PAD4, and we think, yeah, yeah. And we think these cross-reactive antibodies, when they bind, may actually not just protect it from degradation by granzyme B, but may actually stabilize it in the synovial fluid and just protect it from degradation. Maybe that's how they're working. They're helping it stay active longer in the fluid space where it would normally be chewed up. We don't have direct evidence of that, but that's what we're thinking. Hi, yes. Thank you. Um, would you say then that the, the cross-reacting antibody is the cause of the severe disease or the result of the disease? That's a great question. I, what I think, and we have no data to support this, because really, to answer that question, we need longitudinal samples from patients to really know what comes first, the antibody or the severe disease. The antibodies are associated with a longer disease duration, actually. I didn't show that data. But each year a patient has RA, they have an 8% chance of developing the antibody. So it's definitely something that seems to come up later in disease. We don't think it's the cause of RA, for sure. But my personal feeling is that you have patients who have RA, they're making antibodies to citrullinated proteins. And half those patients, they make antibodies to the enzyme, to PAD4. And I think that just through epitope spreading and the kind of amplification of the immune response, some of those people are unlucky enough to spread their epitope now to target a part of PAD4, which is really dangerous. And once they make those antibodies, they just ramp up their disease and turn it on. Even in a patient who's had RA maybe for 15 years and kind of been stable, if they make this antibody, I think they have the potential to go up. That's just my, my feeling. Yeah. That's what we're now, thinking. If they interrupt with DMARD, mm -hmm. what right, so none of the current DMARDs seem to really control these people very well. So methotrexate, TNF inhibitors, steroids don't really seem to control these people. What we think is that maybe you actually need to inhibit the enzyme directly. And so adding on a PAD inhibitor therapy, which is not you know, on the market yet, may actually help these people specifically the most. Yeah. Hi. That's a great story, but just Thanks. along those lines, would these be the RA patients where you would want to try B cell depletion therapies, or has anybody seen if there's a correlation if these particular patients would be the ones that would be most susceptible or treatable that way? Right. That's a great idea, and we haven't looked. Our clinical data isn't detailed enough, really, and their numbers are small, to really say, to, to get at that question. Maybe they are most responsive to B cell depletion, and that's, that's come up before, so I think it's something we need to look at. They're always there in the PAD4 pool, which is why we thought to look to see if they were cross-reactive. We never find a patient who has PAD3 antibodies alone without PAD4. So we really think the dominant target of the immune response is PAD4, and it just so happens that this cross-reactive antibody pops up, and we've developed a tool, really, to, to identify them. Not... Not very well. Um, the problem with PAD3, the substrates aren't as well defined. For PAD4, we know a lot about what's citrullinated. PAD3 is less so, so we haven't really explored PAD3 too much. Yeah. Is it shy? Okay, one more. I mean, I think the thought is that there's some modification to self-protein that kind of draws the attention to the immune system in a susceptible host. Both diseases have a lot of common features. The substrates are targeted as well as the enzymes, transglutaminase and PAD4. There's a, really a lot of parallels, a strong HLA association. They're different, but I think they serve kind of as models with, with a lot of similarities. Yeah. I think, I'm sorry. <laughs> Okay. Oh, you can yeah. ask your leader. Yeah, yeah.
Thank you. Well, she was uh, fantastic. I think everybody agrees on that. Is a, <laughs> a good example for our students how to take a project from the lab and make something useful for patients. I think also as another example of how much antibodies have given to human health. If you think about all the diagnostic tools, we use them all the day, all the time, and we will hear read about the use of them in, for therapy. If only these cells could do the same, that would be in good shape. All right, welcome back after the break. Can we close the door, Mark? Thanks. Pleasure to introduce next speaker, Dr. Tony Gaspari. is a professor of dermatology at the University of Maryland. Uh, he sees both patient and uh, oversees his uh, research laboratory. He's going to talk today uh, to us about the use of ultraviolet light, which, as you know, may be bad, uh, can be bad in some diseases like lupus, but can also be therapeutic. And uh, Dr. Gaspari is going to illustrate some example of that. Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. It's my pleasure to be here today, and I've been a regular attendee uh, when my schedule permits at Knowles Autoimmunity uh, Day, and I love it, and so I'm really pleased to be part of it, and I've certainly known Noel from a lot of years, and he's been very helpful to my career and a great friend and a real scholar gentleman, so again, a great honor to be part of this. So I'll Today, I'll speak about uh, toll-like receptors and the ultraviolet light response in the skin. Um, so a, a brief lesson on photobiology um, about what is ultraviolet light. So sunlight that we could see with our eyes, of course, we see visible light. And then there's, of course, the ultra, ultraviolet light. And depending on the wavelength, we clustered in the UVA, UVB, and UVC. And then there's infrared light. And this is a kind of a very brief summary of the ultraviolet light effects on the skin. So what happens um, is that the atmosphere filters out, the ozone layer filters out UVC, except for parts of the globe where there's thought to be a hole in, in UVC, like in the close to the South Pole. But for the most part, it's filtered out. UVB, a small fragment, fraction of it reaches the sur Earth's surface and UVA uh, floods the Earth's surface. So there's kind of different dosimetries. Um, and so when these wavelengths of light impact on the skin, the more energetic the, or the shorter the wavelengths of the UV, the, the less penetrant it is into the skin. So there's UVB penetrates through the epidermis. UVA penetrates both the epidermis and dermis and can mediate um, biologic effects. So there's, you could classify the biologic effects of uh, ultraviolet light on the skin as the beneficial, as we uh, mentioned, that can be used to treat dermatologic diseases, but there's also detrimental effects, both acute and chronic. So here's a pictorial uh, display of some of the ac acute and chronic harmful effects of UV. So there's the acute sunburn, an overexposure in a fair-skinned individual, a biopsy of that would reveal, of that acute sunburn would reveal sunburn cells, apoptotic keratinocytes. So that's kind of what I'll be discussing today. Um, chronic photo damage, of course, from a lifetime of unprotected sun exposure, wrinkling and dispigmentation, non-melanoma skin cancer as depicted here. Um, but also a, a wide array of autoimmune diseases that are either we consider exquisitely photosensitive or photo exacerbated. So like a patient with chronic cutaneous LE, also known as discoid lupus, is that's a photo exacerbated disease. The malar erythema is a kind of a, an acute, uh, from an acute exposure. Subacute cutaneous LE is also very photosensitive. And um, bullous LE, as depicted here, is also a photosensitive or photoexacerbated disease. Um, so as a background, since this is autoimmunity data, photosensitivity is an important component 
of systemic lupus erythematosus. It's one of the ARA criteria for the disease, along with some other dermatologic manifestations. And the vast majority of patients with systemic lupus exhibit some form of photosensitivity, whether it's transient or persistent, during the course of disease. It's been estimated that about 80% of patients uh, during the course of the disease have some kind of problem with the sun. Uh, it's a presenting sign of, of lupus in about 25% of patients. And so, again, some of these clinical subsets like subacute LE, chronic cutaneous LE, and tumid LE exhibit photosensitivity. And we define photosensitivity based on the patient's history, their skin type, and provocative uh, skin testing that we could do in the clinical setting. Uh, so I mentioned the sunburn cell uh, a little bit earlier, and that, of course, patients with uh, SLE have problems with cell death. So in general, uh, there's an increased rate of apoptotic cells in the lymph node and the blood, and there's impaired engulfment or recognition and uptake of those dead cells. Um, and the apoptosis is increased in the epidermis after, say, UVB or UVA exposure. Uh, and then because of this impaired clearance, uh, the cells that were destined to die by apoptosis that aren't cleared may go on to secondary necrosis, which is kind of an inflammatory cell death. And it's even been demonstrated that some lupus patients have aberrant splicing of a bridging molecule called milk fat globule EGF-8, which is a bridging molecule that uh, bridges with the dead cell and an adhesion molecule that plays a role in engulfment. And complement deficiencies and complement coats dead cells and also uh, promotes clearance, uh, particularly C1Q deficiencies strongly associated with, with LE. So there's abnormalities in cell death in the way uh, cells are, dead cells are processed. And here's an, here's an example of some of the uh, bad stuff that happens from, from UV. It's from the Journal of Dermatologic Science. It's a simple experiment with keratinocyte monolayers, either unirradiated or irradiated with UVB, the shortwave UV, UV light. And then this, that serum from a patient with subacute LE that contains autoantibodies to SSA and SSB. And you can see that the cell surface of the, some of the irradiated keratinocytes is decorated. Uh, with the uh, spe speckled staining with the uh, autoantibody. So it causes transport of cryptic self-antigens from uh, hidden components in the cell to the cell surface. Uh, and that's one of the deleterious effects of UV. And patients that are autoantibody positive uh, thought to play a role in photosensitive diseases. And I also wanted to add um, that this phenomenon occurs in vivo as well. Um, so this is um, a nice summary uh, that was uh, written in a review article in Clinical Reviews in Allergy and Immunology by Vict Victoria Wirth, and the hypothesis is kind of how, how does the photosensitivity get incited in autoantibodies and der dermatologic disease occur in lupus patients. So here's her hypothesis, and there's a lot of experimental data to back this up. So whether it's UV light, viral infection, or some other kind of challenge, a carot an epidermal keratinocyte would undergo programmed cell death, display the autoantibodies in apoptotic blebs, um, have in a healthy individual with this kind of challenge, the programmed cell death, the apoptotic body is cleared in a non-inflammatory fashion. In the lupus patient, there's pro-inflammatory clearance, um, initiating a local inflammatory response, recruitment of autoantibodies and, and T cells and plasmacytoid dendritic cells, creating this kind of uh, vicious cycle. So that's kind of all the background with regard to lupus photosensitivity in a very short, simplified fashion. So now what about uh, toll-like receptors? Now I'll kind of transition to explain how toll-like receptors uh, can fit into this photosensitivity story. So as we all know, the toll-like receptors are a family of innate sensing receptors that protect us from bacterial, viral, and fungal infections. 
They could be either in the extracellular component of the cell, or they could be endocytose, or they can be in the endosome, and they could recognize danger signals either from microbes or self molecules. They utilize a critical adapter molecule for the most part, save for TLR3, MITE88, which is critical adapter molecule for recruiting the signaling complex that's depicted here that results in uh, trans transcription factors and in, in triggering an inflammatory response. But toll-like receptors have also been implicated um, in autoimmunity, allergic diseases, and cancer, so they could have detrimental effects. And so there's emerging evidence uh, that the toll-like receptors are involved uh, in UVR, ultraviolet radiation effects. So here's a summary of some of those studies that TLR4 and 2 are upregulated after UVB exposure. And there's a long-standing observation that C3H HEJ mice, which have impaired TLR4 signaling, are resistant to UV immune suppression. And more recently, a group in Alabama published that TLR4 knockout mice are resistant to immune suppression and have blunted impairment of Tregs after UVR. And Tregs are the so-called suppressor cells that dampen disease. And actually, this is one of the reasons uh, that phototherapy could calm down eczema or psoriasis, because it in induces T regulatory cells. Uh, and the TLR3 has, has also been demonstrated to recognizing uh, non-coding RNA released by necrotic keratinocytes after high doses of UV. But in general, the mechanisms of TLR and immune suppression are not well characterized. Um, rarely, toll-like receptors can serve as uh, death signaling molecules. And there's a couple of instances where bacterial lipopeptides signaling through TLR2, instead of inducing an inflammatory um, component in a, in a target antigen presenting cell, could actually recruit uh, FAD and activate caspase ACE and result in caspase dependent apoptosis. So this led us to hypothesize that TLR signaling may be in involved uh, in UV signaling and play a role in immune suppression. So we, we've started our studies initially with MITE88, the critical adapter, uh, adapter molecule for the, for the majority of toll-like receptors. And we exposed um, mo monocytes or macrophages or other families of antigen-presenting cells to ultraviolet light in vitro. And we, we studied the cell morphology um, within 24 hours, which would be the time frame that cells would undergo apoptosis. So here's an example of a wild-type macrophage. Uh, it's contracting and blebbing and undergoing morphologic changes uh, of apoptosis. In contrast, the mighty 88 macrophage is, is undergoing ballooning degeneration, a cell about to burst by, via a necrotic cell death. Um, another very valuable marker uh, for uh, assessing cell death is, in, particularly in mouse cells, would be the apoptotic DNA ladder. So as these cells contract and bleb off uh, their, uh, the cytoplasm the nu and, and undergo this death process, they also cleave uh, genomic DNA and nucleosomes and create a characteristic ladder. So we compared uh, wild-type macrophages from black six mice with increasing doses of ultraviolet light. This is UVB, 25 millijoules per centimeter squared, and we see the characteristic apoptotic ladder um, in the wild-type macrophages, but a lack of laddering in the um, mighty 88 macrophages. And um, we also compared the TLR4 knockout mice and TLR2 um, knock, um, knockout mice for this phenomenon. And we, and we also screened other uh, TLR knockouts and only found that TLR4 knockout mice lost the ladder like the MITE88. So the basically, 
TLR4 knockouts and, and Mighty 88 knockout mice pretty much have the same phenotype in terms of their cellular death response to ultraviolet light. And this is yet another experiment looking at both the laddering of the TLR, the wild type TLR2 and TLR4 with a couple different doses of UV and also looking at cell survival. So this is an MTT assay in the top panel and the bottom panel is the laddering assay. And again, very reproducibly, these are macrophages, in this case, peritoneal macrophages, didn't ladder after UV, and they also exhibited enhanced survival after um, the UV, UV dosing, compared to either the wild type or the TLR2. Uh, we also looked to see what happened in mouse skin um, in terms of direct UV radiation. And uh, so this is um, wild type or mighty 88 knockout mice. Their skin exposed to a single dose of 70 millijoules per centimeter squared of UVB. And looking at the histologic changes, we see shrunken pink knotic nuclei that are tunnel positive, markedly tunnel positive, which is an insight to stain to identify cells with fragmented uh, DNA or apoptotic cells. In contrast, we didn't see the sh uh, shrunken cells in the epidermis of the mighty 88 knockout mice. We saw sloughing of um, necrotic sheets of epidermis, um, and so the histologic uh, correlate is, is different in terms of the, the manner of cell death. And likewise, when we did tunnel staining, we saw a markedly reduced uh, amount of tunnel staining in the epidermis of um, the knockout mice. Um, and same, same thing both with whole skin and cultured macrophages in terms of um, the way the cells die, comparing the wild type to Mighty 88. This is whole skin. So laddering in the wild type at 24 hours and no laddering in the Mighty 88. And this is predominantly epidermal DNA. So this is really, it tells us that epidermal keratinocytes undergo the same kind of non-apoptotic cell death as do cultured macrophages. We also have additional data that shows the uh, uh, keratinocytes in vitro uh, behave this way. Uh, another biochemical marker of uh, apoptosis is um, cleavage of caspase 3 or activation of caspase 3. And so this is a time course experiment where we're looking at wild type macrophages or mighty 88 macrophages uh, after 25 millijoules of UVB. So within four to eight hours, there's cleavage or activation of caspase 3, but a lack of cleavage or activation. Um, in uh, the um, Mighty 88 knockout mites, and this is densitometry scanning. The ratio of cleaved caspase 3 to uh, beta actin. So um, it's, it's, been, it's well known that in the death world um, that if cells are triggered with a death stimulus, in this case what's depicted here is TNF-alpha, high doses of TNF-alpha, signaling through the TNF receptor um, where the cells will, indu well, it will induce caspase activation and apoptotic cell death, RIP1 inactivation and apoptotic cell death. So in a, in a cell that cannot undergo apoptotic cell death like ZVAD, which is actually a, a pan-caspase inhibitor, and that's been used to demonstrate that if you block the apoptotic cascade by blocking the caspases involved in apoptosis, the default ma manner of cell death will be necroptosis, which involves the RIP1, RIP3, NADPH complex, the necrosome inducing necroptosis. So we were interested in, in determining whether um, the Mighty 88 or TLR4 macrophages that were UV radiated were undergoing necroptotic death or not. And in the wild type uh, macrophages, so within um, two hours after a single dose of 25 millijoules of UVB, we see 
a slight increase in uncleave RIP1, but we see an upregulation or inactivation of, of cleave RIP1 that peaks at about, around 60 minutes. Uh, this inactivation occurs to a much lesser extent in mighty 88 knockout mice, and we see a slight upregulation of RIP3. The antibody is not very good, but it's the best that's available. Uh, and within two hours, an upregulation of RIP3 that we don't see in the wild type macrophages. Uh, and this is the beta actin normalization signal. So uh, the, the basically, this non apoptotic cell death in um, knockout macrophages um, is consistent with a necroptotic death. And along the same lines of being a inf more inflammatory death, we looked at the production of TNF-alpha after uh, UV exposure in the mighty 88 knockout or the wild-type macrophages. So at the level of qPCR within two hours, there's superinduction um, that's significantly greater in the my mighty 88 knockout compared to the uh, uh, wild-type. And at, at the secreted level at 24 hours, there's a significant uh, increase in TNF-alpha secretion. We looked at other cytokines as well, like IL-1, IL-10, IL-6, and there weren't significant differences with those inflammatory cytokines, but marked upregulation of TNF-alpha release, all consistent um, with the idea that this is a more inflammatory kind of cell death. So just to summarize the cell fate data, uh, in the wild types, blebbing, laddering, tunnel staining, caspase cleavage, RIP1 cleavage, in then either mighty 88 or TLR4, uh, we see um, what really looks non-apoptotic death skewed toward a necroptotic death. And we wanted to ask the question, uh, what does this um, necroptotic death do to cutaneous immunity? So we used the mouse contact hypersensitivity model. And it's known that um, UV light is an immunosuppressant. It, it impairs skin-associated lymphoid tissue. It, it messes up longer Hun cell function and their ability to activate Th1, and which the contact sensitization is dependent on intact Th1 responses. So in this model, we shave the mouse skin. This is C57 black 6 background, which are UV susceptible. Four daily days, four, four days, four consecutive days of 70 millijoules of UVB, then sensitized on the belly with the dinitrofluorine benzene, a strong Th1 polarizing lipophilic haptin. Then we elicit on the pinna of the ear and measure uh, ear swelling and uh, suppressor cells. And what we found is that the mighty 88 knockout mice were relatively resistant to UV immune suppression. This is the sensitized only. This is the UV sensitized group, and these are the naive mice. And so we see a significant dampening of the ear swelling response in the wild type and um, less of a dampening in the mighty 88 knockout mice. And this is the pinna of the mouse ear. Um, after 24 hours after sensitiz sensitization and then subsequent challenge. So this is after we measure the ear swelling. At the time of we measuring the ear swelling, we're looking at the pinna. So we could see that in the mighty 88 knockout mice is a fat swollen ear with a neutrophilic and lymphoid infiltrate. In the UV and sensitized, we also have a fat swollen ear. And then in the wild type animals that are sensitized, uh, we have a fat, swollen ear, but less ear swelling uh, in the um, UV-radiated sensitized animal. So consistent with the idea that it's, it's uh, dampening cutaneous immunity in the wild type, but not in the knockout. We also w went to the local lymph node. Uh, we, uh, after UV-radiating mouse uh, skin on the pinna of the ear, 24 hours later, we, we uh, isolated T cells from either the wild type or the mighty 88 knockouts. And we looked at their production of gamma interferon to a potent T cell mitogen. Uh, and we found that in the knockout mice, uh, 
Uh, there was intact gamma interferon responses as measured by interferon secretion at 24 hours in ELISA. And then we also looked at antibody production um, three weeks after haptin sensitization. So in the mouse, um, it, with this haptin sensitization with DNFB, you will see an, an antibody response as well as a T cell response. So we looked at IgG2A production, which is driven by gamma interferon or t secreting or Th1 lymphocytes, and we found that uh, the IgG2A was suppressed in UV-sensitized animals, but not in the mighty 88 animals, implying that there's intact Th1 help, which is consistent with the cytokine production profiles that we saw in the T-cell mitogen assay. So based on all of these data, this leads us to hypothesize that a new function for TLR4, in that uh, we think about TLR4 as being the endotoxin receptor, of course, along with a lot of other microbial and self ligands. And that, so LPS would signal through TLR4, MIT88, recruit IRAC4, and uh, a slew of other signaling molecules, resulting in antigen presenting cell survival and inflammation. In contrast, our hypothesis is that UVR is either uh, somehow perturbing uh, TLR4 or inducing very rapidly a ligand for TLR4, inducing signaling. And instead of recruiting um, the typical uh, cascade of signaling molecules, it's, it's recruiting a death cascade. And so there is some precedent for, for this uh, about a non-canonical extrinsic apoptosis. First of all, it's known that ultraviolet light can mobilize TNF receptors and FAST receptors and cause programmed cell death, a classical extrinsic apoptosis. I mentioned a little earlier that certain bacterial lipopeptides could mobilize uh, a cell death pathway, or either a cytokine pathway or a cell death pathway, and we're hypothesizing that um, UV, UV is triggering this unique pathway. So we have a little bit of experimental data along these lines. One is the, the long-standing observation of endotoxin tolerance. So if you take a macrophage or a monocyte and incubate it with LPS for about 20, 20 hours or so, remove the LPS, and use a standard concentration of LPS to re-stimulate it, it's refractory. And that's refractoriness to signaling or fatigue of the signaling apparatus. And that's what's depicted here. This, so this is a macrophage cell line that's incubated, and we've demonstrated this with primary cells as well, incubated with nothing prior to uh, 10 micrograms of LPS, Compared to the untreated cells, there's close to 750-fold increase in TNF transcripts four hours later, whereas uh, one microgram of LPS pre-incubation renders the cells hyporesponsive or, or tolerant. So we did the same kind of experiment, but instead of a second stimulation with LPS, the second stimulation was via ultraviolet light. So ultraviolet, and these are wild type cells, so ultraviolet light induces a ladder by itself. LPS, one microgram, no ladder. One microgram of LPS for 20 hours in UV, ladder. 10 micrograms of LPS, no ladder. LPS, and then UVB, laddering, meaning cell death. Um, so that's suggestive data, but more definitive data is looking at um, mice that overexpress a catalytically dead form of IRAC4 called KDKI, kinase dead knock in mice. And this is, uh, these mice were provided to us by Stephanie Vogel. So the wild type mice, we UV radiate macrophages, we, they ladder as expected. The IRAC4 KDKI. They ladder as well. So these macrophages from these animals cannot respond to LPS or other uh, uh, TLR-dependent uh, stimuli that signal through IRAC4. And yet these macrophages 
uh, are able to die after UV. The next experiment we did was to look at trafficking of, um, of FAD, uh, kind of the death signaling molecule, into the membrane of either wild type or UV radiated macrophages, uh, wild type or knockout UV radiated macrophages. So we cultured um, primary macrophages, peritoneal macrophages in a cover slip, gave them an exposure to no UV, zero or 10 millijoules per centimeter square of UV, and then stained for FAD uh, and, and studied the cells with confocal microscopy. So this is after 30 minutes uh, after UV exposure. We see recruitment of FAD in a granular fashion to the, um, to the membrane of wild type macrophages and a lack of trafficking of FAD into the knockout mice uh, macrophages after, after UV. And presumably this FAD is being recruited into the mitosome. So we're in processing process of, of co-localizing it uh, in in uh, using confocal microscopy. Um, but we, we also wanted to perform a co-localization experiment utilizing uh, immunoprecipitation. So we uh, started off with MIT-88 knockout bone marrow macrophages, transient transfection with tagged, um, epitope tag MIT-88, UV radiation, and within 10 to 30 minutes after that, we formed a lysate, immunoprecipitated, and then blotted, uh, immunoblotted with FAD. So we're able to pull down um, the FAD at 10 and 30 minutes in the UV radiated uh, macrophages, but not in the um, untransfected uh, macrophages, just slim, slight background. So this is the story. Um, it's more provocative than anything. I haven't done. Um, any, any studies in lupus patients, but th here's some ideas uh, about where we could go with these data. So of course, our first goal is to complete the mapping of the UVR-induced TLR4 MIT-88 death pathway. Um, and it leads to a logical question, impaired TLR4 MIT-88 UV signaling in lupus patient subsets, particularly photosensitive subsets. Um, do other genotoxic stressors like chemotherapy or ionizing radiation using the non-classical extrinsic apoptotic pathway by TLR4 and MIT-88? And then lastly, along the lines of further modeling, um, does UVR along with TLR4 or TLR8 knockout exacerbate the lupus-prone mouse model as does the loss of fast signaling, meaning the MRL uh, LPR mice with have photosensitivity and an SLE type of phenotype. So um, that's my presentation, and I gratefully acknowledge my lab members and my grad student, Erin Harberts, who just finished her PhD thesis with me, and the vast majority of the work depicted is her work, and Stephanie Vogel, who provided invaluable advice and, and valuable reagents and there's my funding. So I thank you for your attention. It's been my pleasure. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's a great question. We haven't looked at that because these are black six mice and they have an intact fast, fast ligand pathway. And that's clearly been demonstrated to be induced by UV, yet in the absence of TLR4 and MIT-88, um, that pathway doesn't appear to be active, at least in using the methods that we're, that we're using. So that needs to be sorted out as well. But it appears that this, 
is dominant in the system that we have because these animals, we've, we've looked at TLR, uh, fast signaling in these animals and TNF receptor signaling, and it's intact. But yet, um, so that's a paradox that we haven't been able to, to work out yet. It appears that MIT-88 and TLR4, the loss of those genes, uh, are dominant in this system. So really interesting question that needs to be pursued. Uh, yes, UVA does have the same effect. It takes a lot higher doses. Uh, we're actually, the kind of light that we're using on the animals uh, is kind of reminiscent of natural sunlight, so it's mostly UVA, and we monitor for, for UVB, so they're really getting both. But if we, we could block UVA so using UVB using certain filters and only irradiate with UVA, if we give much higher doses of UVA, uh, somewhere on the order of about 100 joules per centimeter squared, we could induce the same phenomenon. It just is much more effective, because it's a different kind of DNA damage, but the phenomenon is the same. And so there's, we're seeing the necroptotic death with the UV, with UVA in the Mighty 88 or TLR4 knockouts, and the apoptotic death in, in the wild type uh, macrophages or in the skin. I have a question, Tony. In yeah. your mouse model, is it possible to apply a cream and check the effect whether the creams protect from the, the optotic uh, lesions? Oh, yes. Actually, so the question was about applying like a sunscreen yes, or some, exactly. right. Yes. Absolutely. And uh, actually, this is a, a reasonable model for, for photo protection, in vivo photo protection, uh, both at the level of apoptotic cells as well as the DNA damage, cyclobutane pyrimidine dimers, so either in vivo or skin organ culture, uh, it's possible to block that. that so when uh, people use sunscreen, they reduce the amount of apoptosis? Absolutely, yep. Use your sunscreen, that's the message. No, no sunscreen sponsors here today. <laughs> One more question. Sure. Yes. So, in other words, uh, yes, using UVA, UVA one, and uh, how the, how does that fit into the system? It's basically probably uh, at the doses that are using that they are being used. Uh, it's not triggering a massive wave of apoptosis and may induce some kind of refractory state. If this is all hy hypothetical, but yes, there is a body of literature that UVA1 can be utilized safely and effectively to treat certain photosensitive forms of lupus, as well as other diseases. And some of that is, uh, has to do with kind of chronic subthreshold doses and build up what's called a hardening of the skin, like protective tanning and other adaptive changes in the skin, and perhaps refractoriness of some of these signaling pathways. But there, yes, there is a track record for using long wave UVA and safely in lupus patients. Thank you very much, Tom. Thank you. Excellent. It was another excellent talk. And we come to the last speaker of the morning, is Dr. Lisa Christopher Stein. She's an assistant professor in the Department of Medicine at Bayview. And she's going to talk about a very interesting topic, which is the induction of myopathy by some therapy that we use, very commonly used, the statins. Dr. Stein, please. Thank you. So by way of knowing my audience, are there any clinicians in the audience? A few? Good. And are most of you familiar with statins? Okay. Okay. So before I start, I'd like to tell you that this is a story of science, but it's really a story of collaboration. I'm a clinical researcher, and this is a story of taking something, an observation, from the clinic, from the bedside, to the bench, and back again. And I think it's an excellent story of translational research and how it can work well when people collaborate. 
I spend my time as a co-director of the Johns Hopkins Myositis Center, and it's an interdisciplinary center. The work you'll see today is also largely done by my partner, Dr. Andy Mammon, who's a neurologist, and Dr. Cacciola Rosen, who does the elegant work in autoantibodies at the bench. And it was playwright George Bernard Shaw that once said, if I have an apple and you have an apple, and we exchange these apples, then we each just have one apple. But if I have an idea and you have an idea, and we exchange these ideas, well then we each have two ideas. So with that. So there's some my disclosures. The objectives today are broad. To first get us all on the same page, I would briefly like to review histopathological differences and the phenotype autoantibody relationship in the inflammatory myopathies, which are commonly known as myositis. I'd like to also review what's currently known about statin myotoxicity, this idea of what was known as statin myopathy, as a direct toxic insult. And then, most importantly, to look carefully at the clinical and pathologic features of this newly described autoimmune myopathy, which is closely related to, perhaps causative, uh, from statin exposure. I always start with the patient, and this is a real patient who came to see me. She's a 58-year-old woman with a history of hyperlipidemia. You can see her story begins 10 years ago in 2004. She first took one statin, a torvastatin, at very high doses. This is a typically, relatively high dose back in 2004, and it's unclear from her medical records why she was started at such a high dose. She took this for five months. Her liver enzymes were normal initially, and the CK was unknown. Looking back, within five months, she developed muscle pain, and the statin was stopped. Nobody thought to actually check any muscle enzymes that we could tell in her medical record. Going on in the chronological history, by August of 2005, her liver enzymes were seen to be elevated, but again, the CK was unknown. So one can infer that that could be a liver of liver etiology, or these liver enzymes, as you may know, are also of skeletal muscle origin, so they could have represented skeletal injury at that time. By June of 2006, all of her parameters were normal, and then she started on a second statin, provastatin, 40 milligrams for three months. Muscle pain occurs almost immediately within three months, and now, once again, the drug is discontinued. This time, within one month later, someone did finally check some clinical labs, and her CK was markedly elevated. A normal CK is around 150 to 200. Her CK was close to 2,000. Going on, her CK continued to rise despite the discontinuation of the statin. By February of 2008, her muscle pain intensified, and then she begins to be weak. Proximal muscle weakness. She begins to be unable to get out of a chair, lift her arms over her head. By uh, uh, the, it fights between 2008 and 2009, she becomes progressively weaker. Muscle biopsy shows patchy necrosis without a lymphocytic infiltration. And her electromyogram testing is inconclusive, and her muscle enzymes rise dramatically to nearly 9,000. So the conclusion from physicians at that point, is they call her ear illness mysterious. None really believe the statin can be to blame because she has continual progression, even though we withdrew the drug. It doesn't appear to be autoimmune. There's no primary inflammation. I'll show you examples of that. Looking at muscle biopsy, there wasn't the typical hallmark of polymyositis, as we typically know myositis, and no known myositis-specific autoantibodies in commercialized testing laboratories. And I'll show some data of how these autoantibodies are very disease-specific and how they often tell us about disease. So with that, this woman was offered no treatment in the absence of a diagnosis. And we have a referral service here, Hopkins USA, and she wrote, all the doctors I've seen are puzzled. They've ruled out a lot of diseases because there's no muscle inflammation. There's evidence of muscle damage. I'm hoping you'll see me, as I don't know how much worse my condition will get, and I don't want to end up in a wheelchair, if there is an answer for me. And when you interviewed her, she strongly felt that the statin was to blame, and she sought our input. And an often quoted physician here at Hopkins says, listen to the patient. He's telling you the diagnosis. So let's see if she was right. This is what we knew about statin myopathy. First, I have to tell you that it's a billion dollar industry, billion with a B. The, lipid, uh, the use of uh, lipid lowering therapy in the statin category grew from the early 1990s to the early 2000s from 50% to nearly 90% of what we use as clinicians. And in a five year period, that statin use doubled. If you keep extrapolating out, we're looking at somewhere around 43 million statin takers potentially. So even a relatively rare side effect could have large implications in, in a, uh, a ubiquitously prescribed drug. We know, before I vilify them, and some people actually, every time I say I'm, gonna t say I'm gonna talk about this, the question is, should I stop my statin? I think the answer is probably no. But let me tell you that it certainly contributes to 30% reduction or more in cardiovascular disease and relatively minimal adverse drug effects or adverse drug reactions and morbidity. 
Now, the guidelines have recently changed. We're not looking at specifically targeting bad cholesterol, LDL, but in fact, we're looking at major statin groups, looking at them overall and estimating the risk. And what you need to take away is the fact that high-dose statin therapy is actually offered to several um, of these risk groups right from the get-go to try to reduce that bad cholesterol by 50%. And so these guidelines, as you can see, expand the indication for statin use. Why does it matter? Those, the bullet on the bottom is probably the most telling. So the new guidelines obviously increase the numbers, but if you are an adult between the ages of 60 and 75 and you do not have cardiovascular disease and you are a male, the chance of you being eligible for a statin goes up from the current guidelines of 30% to 87%. If you're a woman, 21% of you would require a statin, but the new guidelines say that 54% of you will require it. So I just want to give you the scope before we talk about the science. Nonspecific muscle pain and weakness are really common. Frank rhabdomyolysis with muscle breakdown doesn't happen as often. In fact, it's quite rare, about 0.1% of statin takers. And the incidence of the most common complaint, people complain of muscle and joint pain. If you actually look at the clinical trials, there's no real difference between placebo and statin takers. But if you look in the real world, up to 25% of people tell you that they hurt when they take a statin. And the prevalence of high CKs, is around 70,000 people if you look at all those statin takers. But what's most important and what really plagued me for probably 10 years is this, that muscle symptoms and high serum CK levels persisted even after we withdrew the drug. So for years we told the patient, we've taken the drug away. You can't possibly have disease from it. Let's go back to cholesterol synthesis. It starts with acetyl-CoA and what's most important as we go down the pathway, sorry, is this enzyme. HMG-CoA reductase, or 3-hydroxy-3-methylglutarol-CoA reductase. I'll call it HMGCR for uh, obvious purposes. The statin inhibits that enzyme, and that enzyme is the rate-limiting enzyme in cholesterol production. So how do we think that statins mediate uh, muscle toxicity? Some people thought by decreasing cholesterol, you actually alter the myocyte membrane itself. Others thought, well, maybe with ubiquinone, you reduce, the, the reduction in this disrupts mitochondrial function, and that is the reason that some people give CoQ10 as uh, one of the therapeutic measures to try to mitigate this toxicity. Then there's the thought about isoprenate depletion, activating potentially an apoptotic pathway. Statins and autoimmunity have long been considered a, in, in relation. Some feel, and it's known, that they believe they actually have anti-inflammatory effects. I was always interested in from another, uh, another angle. And looking back eight years ago, when I reviewed this topic, it was seemingly that although statin-related myotoxicity is generally believed to be this non-inflammatory toxic myopathy, there was growing experimental evidence at that point that suggested that this myopathy may in fact be tri triggered by an autoimmune reaction or conversely that the statin itself triggered that process. But the mechanism at that point was unknown. There were postulates that said that statins might have an actual immunomodulatory direct effect on T lymphocytes and can promote a shift of Th1 to Th2 and lead to B cell hyperreactivity and um, production of pathogenic autoantibodies. Or there was also a specific statin binding site on T lymphocytes, which were involved in selective inhibition of uh, LFA, and it had been described. But this never really seemed to translate clinically. Now, I'm going to take you a step back so that we can understand what myositis was or auto -inflam uh, idiopathic inflammatory myopathies as I learned them and as they are understood. This is the long list. The most uh, commonly known ones that heard of would be polymyositis, dermatomyositis, and inclusion body myositis. And they have specific diagnostic criteria. Clinically speaking, you have uh, proximal muscle weakness in your shoulder and your hip girdle, elevated enzymes, muscle enzymes, EMG or electromyogram uh, abnormalities, and then typical changes on muscle biopsy, which I'll show you. If you have all four of the first four, you're said to have definitive polymyositis. If you have a rash typical of dermatomyositis, which is a rash on the eyelids or the knuckles uh, of the hands, and three of the top four at least, you have definitive dermatomyositis. And here's a very brief muscle histology review. On the top left, let's see if I can do it here. So this is normal muscle in cross section. The muscle cells are uniform. They are normal. Uh, they are uh, uniform shape and size, and the nuclei are on the periphery. Here on the right, this is polymyositis. This is consistent with polymyositis, which is primary inflammation, where normal myofibers are surrounded by but not invaded by inflammatory cells. Down here, this is dermatomyositis. This is stain showing perifascicular atrophy, where between the muscle fascicles, 
For reasons entirely not clear, uh, the myocytes get smaller as they approach each fascicle. And then um, also in dermatomyositis, the initial inflammatory response is actually at the vessel. So it's really a vasculopathy probably with the myocyte being an innocent bystander. But there was a growing evidence that there was a newcomer. And as I say that really collaborative approach was important as rheumatologists were labeling everything sort of as polymyositis, Neurologists looking under the microscope at histopathology initially said, you know, I think there's another, uh, there's another category of disease we should look at, and it was, uh, the growing name of this was immune-mediated necrotizing myopathy. Now, this is what necrotizing myopathy looks like, and you don't have to be a histopathologist to know that it doesn't look like that, right? So what you see is degeneration, regeneration, and necrosis, but what's Character characteristically missing are the lymphocytes. What probably mediates uh, the inflammatory response here is actually macrophages that come later. So, necrotizing myopathy by itself is really nonspecific. It can be seen in muscular dystrophy, it can be seen in malignancy, it can actually be seen with statins when they cause a toxic response that eventually dissipates. It can be seen, um, although, in other immune mediated myopathies. Now, I told you that there's something called myositis-specific antibodies, and two of those in which we do see at occasionally an immune-mediated myopathy. The, the most prototypical is something called anti-SRP, which targets signal recognition particle, and JO1, which actually targets histidyl tRNA synthetase. And I'm going to go through that with you in a moment. Stay with me. I promise to come back to the statins. So, but there was a subset, a substantial portion of patients with necrotizing myopathies that had none of these known associations. So we had two problems, which was actually one. Patients who took statins, who continued to have an autoimmune myopathy we didn't understand, and patients who were having a, a necrotizing myopathy with no known explanation that looked autoimmune for reasons I'll show you. So we know in our diseases that distinct profiles of autoantibodies are evident in clinically distinct autoimmune syndromes. So surely in lupus, scleroderma, and Sjogren's syndrome, as well as myositis, we have a very uh, tight autoantibody phenotype. And I'll show you an example of that in these tRNA synthetases. And just by level of review, certainly you guys are probably closer to this than I, remember that tRNA synthetases are responsible for immunoacetylation acetylation to uh, tRNA. Why this is the immune target or how this causes disease is definitely up for debate. Suffice it to say that if you have one of these antibodies, you often have the clinical syndrome that you see here. It's multifaceted. It consists of a non, non I'm sorry, an inflammatory but non-erosive arthritis that looks a lot like rheumatoid arthritis but doesn't tend to have the erosions that Dr. Darrow showed you in her presentation. Fever. This idea of mechanics hands, which is a roughening of the uh, palmar surface and uh, digits, which be, appears to be immunologically mediated. Interstitial lung disease. Raynaud's phenomenon and the uh, myositis itself. So these are associated with very specific antibodies, including anti-JO1, histidyl tRNA synthetase, among others. PL12, for example, targeted, targets allineal tRNA synthetase. Likewise, there's also the phenomenon of anti-SRP, or signal recognition particle. You may remember that this is the complex of proteins that recognizes and targets proteins to translocate them across the endoplasmic reticulum. Again, why this is an immunologic target is poorly understood, but it causes a very significant syndrome of early atrophy, severe myalgias, heart involvement. And this is an, um, a cross-section of MRI and patient on the above, one that we were able to arrest the disease with therapy, and one on the bottom in which we were not. And just to give you a frame of reference here, this is what normal muscle should look like, dark gray. And you can see for sure there's absence in the posterior compartment here but almost global absence of muscle with unbridled inflammation, ongoing uh, destruction of the muscle with time. So these myositis-specific antibodies are numerous, and I told you that immune-mediated necrotizing myopathy, the most prominent one, is anti-SRP, but there was this question mark on the bottom, and we were seeing a phenomenon where we could not understand it. Fortunately, I think also one of the strengths of our research is that we conduct longitudinal cohort analysis in a rare disease. So when a patient enters our clinic um, after they ag agree to provide um, IRB approval to collect their information, we collect cl clinical information, DNA, and then we collect serum longitudinally. So we're sometimes able to go back in time to actually take a look forward. So we had the fortunate ability of Dr. Cassiola Rosen systematically, longitudinally looking at um, serum Using HeLa cell lysids and showing the immunoprecipitation pattern that you see here, we initially noticed that this uh, necrotizing myopathy 
was not associated with, in many patients, was not associated with anything we had seen before, but in fact was associated with a new autoantibody specificity to 200 and 100 kilodalton proteins. We call this anti-200-100. So we thought that anti-200-100 probably represented a new myositis-specific antigen, autoantibody, and reported this uh, in 2010. So that study showed that of the 454 consecutive patients at that point, 225 of them had both sera and muscle biopsy specimens available for review in our center. We looked at their clinical information. We looked at pulmonary function tests, MRI of their muscles, uh, EMG or um, electromyogram studies, screening for malignancy, and a standard laboratory evaluation. As I told you, the antibody specificities were assessed by immune precipitation from 35 vesmethionine labeled HeLa cell lysates, and the muscle biopsies were looked at carefully for evidence of, you see there. The biopsies were stained for MAC, as well as MHC uh, class one, which I don't um, show you the evidence for, but I'll give you the, the scientific data, and endothelial cells. And going forward, this was the uh, graphical results of what happened. So of the patients we started with, only 38 had prominent necrosis. 12 of them had a known association of why they had this uh, immunity, or excuse me, um, necrotizing myopathy. The remaining 26 had no other myositis-specific antibody or other diagnosis to explain what we were seeing. The novel autoantibody that I just showed you was seen in 16 of these 26 patients, so it represented 62% of the patients that we previously did not understand. I'm not sure why. If you could see it, I, can, I don't know why, but um, what it should show is that the serum from patients with the necrotizing myopathy um, precipitated. What we did is we took patients that were known, so not what you would see is uh, nine of 16 patients here are recognizing that 200, 100 kilodalton doublet, um, which were shown, and then the control lane was Joe one serum, which did not show that precipitation pattern. Muscle biopsy features were looked at, so there was very little inflammatory cells, very mild degree of inflammation, typical of what we would see in polymyositis, for example. There was no denervation, and no, nothing stained abnormal for glycogen or amyloid. The small blood vessels um, were positive for a membrane attack complex, and the deposition was seen on non-necrotic myofibers. You can see that the specimen from one of our patients looks at MAC deposition on scattered non-necrotic fibers, which you can see by the red arrows, and then um, there's absence of MAC staining on endomesial capillaries. What I haven't shown you here also is that MHC class 1 was upregulated, which is atypical in normal muscle cell and commonly seen in an autoimmune process in the myocytes. Clinically, these patients were middle-aged. They were more women than men. Um, they had very a strong indication of proximal muscle weakness, and their CK levels, or their muscle enzymes, were not subtle. They were quite high in the range of 10,000. They had a lot of edema in their muscles on MRI, consistent with inflammation. They hurt. They had myalgia 75% of the time. Their joints hurt, and they had dysphagia and ability to swallow 63% of the time, with um, Raynaud's phenomenon being not common in this group. And they responded to immunosuppression. So 64% had a complete or near-complete near response in that first study. And although this is actually a little more sobering to date, that none relapsed in 50% of that original cohort, as we've carried that data forward, it turns out that if you stop the immunosuppression, many of these patients relapse. OK. What we found very intriguing <coughs> is that statin use was prominently featured in this group. So if you look at the page, 10 of 16 of them, where 63% had used statins, and particularly over the age of 50, 83% had seen a statin. It was a variable statin, and the length of time used between discontinuing that statin and doing the muscle biopsy ranged up to 14 months, where there were still features of the muscle biopsy that were consistent with necrosis. And if you look, if we said, well, maybe statins are just ubiquitously prescribed. Perhaps it's not really the statin. It's just a commonly prescribed drug. But if you looked at our cohort and looked at um, dermatomyositis or polymyositis, or even an inclusion body myositis, it turns out that 83% uh, of patients with our, the antibody, especially in the, in the older age category, had statin use uh, evidence, whereas only 25 and 36% uh, respectively in the other groups. And that was statistically significant. So the conclusions from the initial study st uh, showed that patients with this uh, specificity, this new autoantibody specificity, we believed represented a distinct subgroup of necrotizing myopathy that previously we would have called autoantibody negative. We thought that the 200-100 the, uh, kilodalton um, protein might be subunits of some protein complex. And there was evidence, as I showed you, to support an immune-mediated myopathy responsive to immunosuppression. The most intriguing part was the statin exposure enhanced in the population. So the next task at hand was to identify the autoantigen recognized by these autoantibodies. 
Um, so I'm going to go back for a moment and talk about our patient. So this patient, I told her, she walked through the door at the right time. Had she walked through our clinic door just two years earlier, we would have told her what everybody told her. We have no idea what's causing this, and we're concerned about treating you. But we had seen this pattern, and we believed that she might respond to therapy. So she begins treatment initially with prednisone and azathioprine. She did have a partial response, and we, she actually underwent a second muscle biopsy because her first muscle biopsy was a bit inconclusive. <coughs> Excuse me. It was widely sh showing widespread necrotizing myopathy in the absence of primary inflammation. Because she had an impartial response, we attempted an intravenous in, uh, gamma globulin, and within four months of starting IVIG, her strength normalized. She went from a woman who had to be pushed up the stairs from her, by her husband to be able to ascend, ascend any staircase to being able to walk on her own, and her CK normalized to from nearly 9,000 to 43. The presence of the autoantibodies, the 200-100, was confirmed in our research lab by immunoprecipitation for her. We weren't the first to recognize this. At the same time we were seeing this, our colleagues in Australia described eight cases, all with myofibrin necrosis, all had an inflammatory infiltrate, I'm sorry, three had an inflammatory infiltrate, all with, um, in, with very strong myonecrosis in the absence of a strong infiltrate of lymphocytes. All cases, there was diffuse. Uh, upregulation of MHC class 1 on the non-necrotic fibers, and progressive improvement occurred in many of their cases. Similarly, a, uh, a cohort in Boston uh, of 25 patients over the, an eight-year period also met very similar criteria, exactly as what I've just shown you here. Proximal muscle weakness, elevated muscle enzymes, persistent weakness even after you discontinued the drug, improvement with immunosuppression, and a muscle biopsy showing necrosis without inflammation. So we reason that statin-associated autoimmune myopathy with these antibodies would provide a model system for defining a mechanistic relationship between something in the environment, a specific drug exposure, and developing an autoimmune response. So identifying the target autoantigen by the immune response was the critical first step. And I'll remind you that I'm a clinical scientist, and my colleagues in the lab, when I said we, you know, this would be great when we could do this, they said this could be an entire career. Uh, so fortunately, uh, some smart people made some smart guesses, and this is the story. So there was an important clue, that if you took mavenolin, which is a statin, that treatment upregulated autoantigen expression of this protein. So if you can see on the left, um, it's mevalin, <coughs> excuse me, without mavenolin and with mavenolin, excuse me, for 24 hours prior to radio labeling. So we demonstrated that statin exposure upregulates exposure of the autoantigens. And this was the smartest guess, that given the statin exposure increases expression of this enzyme, we knew that HMGCR weighed about 97 kilodaltons. Someone suggested that it be investigated whether the enzyme actually may be that 100 kilodalton autoantigen. And although science is never really this uh, wonderful, indeed, the identity of the 100 kilodalton autoantigen was confirmed by precipitating in vitro translated HMGCR protein. So serum from those patients originally identified with this protein specifically recognized the, the, the intracellular catalytic domain of HMGCR. And experimental evidence suggests that these are co-precipitated, the 200 and 100 kilodalton proteins, and initially thought that the 200 kilodalton uh, protein is a dimer, but it does not appear to be so at this point. All 16 of those original patients that were positive for, by IP were uh, also positive by, um, later um, by <coughs> this methodology. And so um, that work was published. At that point, so we had looked, at this point we had now 300 plus more patients, so 750 patients, and these autoantibodies were found by ELISA in 45 of the 750, or 6% of the patients referred to us. 92% of those patients over the age of 50 were statin exposed. I will show you some data, and, and obviously not everyone is statin exposed. This autoantibody specificity isn't 100% linked to statins, and some patients without statin exposure still do make this, uh, make this autoantibody. And again, the prevalence was significantly higher if you looked across um, groups of myopathy. So what about those patients with and without statin exposure? They were really clinically indistinguishable, except that they were younger if they had not seen a statin. They had a bit of a higher CK, and they were more often to be black than white. And there was a slightly more uh, inflammation on the biopsy in those patients. And I think that's still telling us something that we're not entirely sure what that means. OK, back to statins, what we knew. What do we think we know now? Remember that HMGCR is the rate limiting um, step. Uh, HMGCR reductase is <coughs> limits HMG CoA, and therefore limits cholesterol production. If you decrease cholesterol, you actually increase HMGCR and perhaps provide a target for autoantibody. Why does it persist when you take the statin away? 
there was very elegant work from Dr. Castro Rosen, who had previously shown that it was regenerating muscle cells that expressed high levels of autoantigen. It wasn't the mature myocyte, but in fact myoblast in mature, in mature muscle. This may in fact then sustain the immune response after the statin is discontinued. So remember that regenerating muscle cells are abundant in immune-mediated necrotizing myopathy, and they really appear to be the repair mechanism. So precisely the mechanism by which you try to repair the muscle injury essentially provides an endless supply, potentially, of autoantigen. Why do we know this is true? In the top panel, <coughs> pardon me, these are HMG-positive pa patients with anti-HMG-CR antibodies. This is control in, uh, excuse me, in A. You see staining for neural cell adhesion molecule, or NCAM, which stains for um, regenerating muscle cells. In B, this is HMGCR staining, and you can see that there's co-localization of HMGCR and, uh, at, this, at the site of regenerating muscle, and this does not happen in the control muscle. How about the prevalence of these antibodies in statin-exposed and statin-unexposed patients in large data sets? Maybe it's just a marker for statin use, and it doesn't really have anything to do with disease. Um, so we screened a, a subsample of the ARA cohort and looking at 881 statin-naive patients and 763 current statin exposures, and none of these were anti-HMGCR positive. Are these antibodies found in patients with self-limited statin intolerance? Remember, I told you that some patients just complain of muscle pain, so if my muscle aches, am I likely to have this antibody? Turns out probably not. Looking at a large cohort of patients with familial hypercholesterolemia due to a specific gene mutation, an LDL receptor, and excuse me, with 51 with intolerance to statins, it required them to stop the drug because of muscle weakness or myalgias. None of them were positive for anti-HMGCR. So we think it appears to be highly specific. It looks like it's only found in patients with autoimmune myopathy, not found in those with self-limited statin intolerance. And in patients with statin-associated muscle symptoms, we believe that a negative HMGCR ELISA test predicts self-limited disease. Are there immunogenetic risk factors for developing anti-HMGCR? Indeed, there are. If you do HLA typing of these patients versus controls, the HLA DR11 is seen in 70% of our patients compared to only 18% of controls, which is highly statistically significant in Caucasians. Likewise, in African Americans, the same thing was seen. If you do fine mapping and look at DRB1-1101, this has a very strong association, one of the strongest HLA associations between, uh, known between an allele and an autoimmune disease. Fine mapping shows that the odds ratio for DRB1-1101 in Caucasian subjects has an odds ratio of 20, nearly 25. In African Americans, it's nearly 57. It's a pretty significant association. So what have we learned today? HMGCR is the major target of autoantibodies in statin-associated immune-mediated necrotizing myopathy. Those regenerating muscle cells express high levels of HMGCR, which we believe may sustain the immune response even when you withdraw the drug. These antibodies are found in those with immune-mediated necrotizing myopathy, not in those with statin intolerance, self-limited statin intolerance. And statins may trigger um, this immune response by increasing that expression of HMGCR, which I've shown you. There's a genetic risk. HLA DRB1-1101 is a strong risk factor for developing, developing these antibodies. So I want you to remember, those of you that are clinicians in the room, that in addition to self-limited toxic myopathy, that these statins are associated with immune myopathy, which is progressive despite statin cessation. Our patient was right. Most cases appear to respond to immunosuppression, but fairly potent immunosuppression is necessary and often seemingly needs to be continued for a long time. This work is not done in a vacuum. I told you that uh, in addition to myself, Dr. Andrew Mammon has uh, prominently done a lot of this work as a neurology colleague of mine who also is a bench scientist as well as Livio Castiola Rosen. This is our team at the Myositis Center, including pulmonology, um, rheumatology, uh, immunology, and, uh, and neurology. So we are um, proud of our multidisciplinary effort. And that approach not only translates to patient care, but translates to good clinical research as well. And these are my team as well as my support. Thank you so much for your attention. I'm happy to take questions. This is, this is the number one question, and I know it, and I always feel like I should have the slide after that says I don't know. Um, so, I, you know, but obviously my colleagues at the bench are trying to prove that. We actually don't have conclusive proof of that, and that is, 
I think there's just indirect evidence that suggests that because of the mechanism of what HMGCR does in cholesterol cascade, knowing that it's, it's uh, elevated and it's so closely associated with statin use, that there's indirect evidence, but no. And we have been uh, told that part of the uh, Part of the issue is that we have not been able to show that they're pathogenic. But as you know, and as uh, Erica Dara told you, pathogenicity is so hard to show truly causative and how they would do that. So they are a marker. I mean, it's the idea that you've got, you know, in the presence of these antibodies, you're continuing to get damage. So then you're continuing to create, so the same thing would be the perfect example. So it's the, there is, oh, and, that, and the evidence also, I haven't, in the interest of time, so the other indirect evidence for that is that we looked at clinical markers. So for example, uh, weakness, uh, uh, correlating weakness as well as CK levels over time with autoantibody titer, and they do track. And interestingly, they track in those who are statin exposed and they don't track in the statin naive. So it almost seems like there's two separate disease processes. But those that are statin exposed seem to show uh, a decremental a titer of antibodies over time as they clinically get well. So again, indirect evidence, but not conclusive. It's not going to sound like a broken record, but are these patients ever put on B-cell depletion therapy? Yeah, so good question. Do we use B-cell depletion therapy? And interestingly, again, clinical observation that I haven't translated to science yet, but hope to, those patients who are statin naive do better on B-cell depletion than those patients who are statin exposed. Again, I don't know why. The converse is true. Intravenous gamma globulin works much better in patients who are statin exposed, and it doesn't seem to touch those, for the most part, who are statin naive. So we have a similar, there's an antibody causing a similar uh, d uh, clinical disease that seems to have preferential therapy based on your exposure. Yeah, great question. So I told you that the initially I would have told you that 50% remained well, and they did. But now four years later, I'd say, and I, we're going to publish this, the vast majority relapse. So in, what I have determined also is that if you treat them early and recognize this early, they seem to get better quickly, and they often don't need continued immunosuppression. And when I say non-continued, they're on immunosuppression for at least one year. But after that, I have been able to discontinue some. It seems that those that had the early recognition did better. We're getting better now that we know what we're seeing, but for years these patients had no therapy, some of them for eight years, ten years. So at that point I'm not sure that you could ever get the horse back in the barn. Please. So um, how has your work worked the pathogenicity of the antibodies? Yeah. Have you done actual transfer? Have you immunized the uh, animals? Uh, do the antibodies go down? So I think the answer to all of that, and let me be clear that that work for sure is Dr. Mammon's. I am still mostly, as you know, a clinical scientist, so I myself have not been in the lab to do it. I know that Andy is actively trying to do all of those things. So because that question has come up so much, I think that that work is ongoing. But my understanding to date is that there's no conclusive evidence that, that that's, um, that's positive to date. But that is a transfer. I, not that I'm aware of. I, my I don't want to misspeak for Andy, but my understanding is no. It's either not yet been accomplished or not shown to be um, to be evident. But it's definitely on the radar for us to look at because so of the. There's one other thing that's dangerous uh, in thinking about the statin. Statin treatment of dendritic cells preserves their immaturity, which makes. Yeah, again, I don't think, that, I'm actually, I don't really believe that that's been looked at at all. That's a very intriguing uh, mechanism that we'll have to look into. So have you looked uh, for your 200, 100 doublet in other organ-specific injuries uh, that are, that are drug-induced? Uh, See whether it's specific for muscle disease? I mean, this is a fairly ubiquitous uh, enzyme, and you can find it at high levels in the liver. And like with liver, liver injury after um, drug-induced liver injury is extremely common, right? It's not seen in that cohort. So the answer to drug-induced liver injury or even autoimmune hepatitis, any co uh, cohort of liver injury does not seem to have these autoantibodies. It's been looked at in liver specifically. Okay. So that, it looks pretty specific for muscle. Other, 
N neuropathy or skin. Liver, no, and others unknown. It's so true. This is true. Yeah. For sure. Thanks. Good afternoon. So I would like to start our afternoon session of autoimmunity day with the pleasure and privilege to introduce our second keynote speaker. Uh, her name is Anne Rothstein. She is a professor of medicine and rheumatology in the University of Massachusetts. She did her bachelor degree in the University of Washington in St. Louis and her PhD in UPenn in uh, Philadelphia. And her lifelong interest is in understanding pathogenesis of systemic autoimmune diseases using mostly uh, animal uh, models. She has published and uh, studied uh, T cells and B cells activation, function, longevity, and apoptosis in these models of systemic autoimmune diseases. And she has become lately intrigued by the role of innate immune response in the systemic autoimmunity. Her lab is the first one to uh, understand and describe the role of TLRs in pathogenesis of lupus. With that, I would like to welcome our keynote speak speaker, please. Thank you. Okay, so I just really would like to thank Noel and all of the rest of the uh, organizing committee for this meeting for including me uh, in today's session. It was a great set of talks this morning. I really enjoyed um, hearing about some of the things that are going on here. I'm, I'm great fans of the Johns Hopkins autoimmunity community, so it was really fun to be part of all this. Um, you know, I think I'm going to leave my glasses on just because I'm looking at the screen here. Okay, so I think I'm going to start where uh, we left off uh, with the keynote this morning, which is, well, what are the mysteries in autoimmunity? And for me, uh, the mystery is why are autoantigens autoantigens? And I think the whole issue was summarized really very nicely by Paul Plotz back in 2002 um, in this article that he wrote for Nature Reviews Immunology where he pointed out that of the many, many human proteins, only one to two percent of them are targets in autoimmune diseases. And so what is it that sets autoantigens apart from all the other proteins that presumably are available to the immune system, why are those particular antigens targeted? And his conclusion was that there had to be properties of these proteins that were the autoantigens that somehow allowed them to immuno, to somehow stimulate or acquire immunostimulatory properties and be able to activate the immune system. And so in this day and age, we've learned a lot about the adaptive immune system and the innate immune system. And we've come to realize that the quote unquote innate immune system is governed by a series of so called pattern recognition receptors that can detect, supposedly, the differences between host cells and microbial cells. Only it turns out that this same distinction between foreign and self is also the distinction between safe and dangerous. And so, self proteins can somehow acquire properties that make them dangerous and thereby make them targets for the innate immune system. And the question is, which autoantigens are engaging which receptors in the innate immune system to drive autoimmune disease? So I'll start out by giving you some examples from the nucleic acid sensing story, and then try and take it maybe one step further. We'll see, okay? So what I, I, I have four little stories to tell you today. I promise I won't go past my time, so if, if I start going too far, I'll stop and um, we, we won't go there. But I'll start with the role of toll-like receptors in lupus. I, I will say that all of the data that I'm going to show you today is essentially unpublished, so it may not be the absolute final story, but I figured it would be a little bit more interesting than going through um, what I've written about um, for a number of years now. And so the first first point I'm going to try and tell you about is a role for TLR9 as opposed to TLR7. Uh, 
in lupus. And then I'm going to start talking about some of the non-TLR nucleic acid sensing receptors and how they may or may not contribute to disease. And uh, then at the very end, on a completely separate note, because I really was trained as a T-cell immunologist and I haven't had a chance to talk about T-cells in a long time, and I recently had an MD-PhD student who's become interested in, in the role of CD8 cells in autoimmunity. I'll try and touch on that as well, okay? So first of all, let's talk about nucleic acid sensors and autoimmunity. Okay, so I think this slide uh, is somewhat similar to your introduction to toll-like receptors that you got uh, earlier today. The point I want to make here uh, is this is supposed to be a cell, and the toll-like receptors that I'm interested in in the context of autoimmunity are those toll-like receptors that can detect nucleic acids. And I'll argue that at least in lupus, a significant majority of the autoantigens are either DNA or RNA binding proteins or DNA or RNA themselves, and that the reason those are autoantigens is because they have the capacity to engage this particular set of pattern recognition receptors, mainly the nucleic acid sensing endosomal TLRs. Now, these toll-like receptors, TLR9 and TLR7, TLR9 recognizes DNA, so for my slides, just so I don't lose people, DNA is a blue squiggle and RNA is a red loop. So TLR7 will recognize RNA, TLR9 will recognize DNA. These TLRs are located in these endocytic lysosomal compartments. Uh, they start in the ER and they get to these compartments because they're carried by a trafficking protein called UNC93B1. And so in order for the autoantigen to get to these receptors, it has to come into the cell, usually through a receptor-mediated process. And in the case of a B cell, that receptor is going to be antibody that's going to bind some form. I'll call this sort of a generic cell debris. So this is, when you see a squiggle here, this is cell debris. And that cell debris can be associated with DNA or RNA. It can be taken up by the antibody uh, B cell receptor and carried to one of these compartments or if you have an immune complex, uh, it can be detected by an FC receptor that's present on macrophages or dendritic cells, and again, carried into one of these compartments. And I've actually put TLR9 and TLR7 in two separate compartments. Uh, at least the dogma this year would say that they do traffic to different compartments, whether that's really the case. Um, I think the jury is still out. Um, I've also sort of drawn TLR7 as TLR9 is working through more or less the same signaling cascade because that's exactly what's in every single review article that you'll read about these receptors, is that they signal through an IRAC4-dependent pathway, and there's a branch through TRAF6 uh, that works through TAC1 that can activate NF-kappa-B and MAP kinase pathways to give rise to pro-inflammatory cytokines, and another branch that can work through uh, IRF7, IRF5 to give you type 1 interference. And these are the cytokines that then, uh, in the context of lupus, um, can give rise to many of the different um, uh, features of, of autoimmune disease. Now, my main interest has been on the B cells, and so let me just say one other thing about B cells in the context of lupus. Again, in the textbooks, we're taught that the main antigen-presenting cell for naive T cells is a dendritic cell. But I would argue, or I'm going to try and convince you, and I think there is data in the literature, that B cells that are activated by a combination of the B cell receptor and one of these TLRs become really outstanding antigen presenting cells for naive T cells. And indeed, not our data, but data from Mark Slomchek would tell us that B cells in the context of lupus play a very important role in antigen presentation. If, if you get rid of B cells, you don't get activated T cells in the context of lupus. So B cells can make antibody, that's one of the things they do, they can also serve as antigen presenting cells and they can also make cytokines. So there are lots of different ways that B cells are going to contribute to autoimmune disease. Okay, so um, having said the, that seven and nine are more or less both involved and that there is a substantial in vitro literature saying that RNA or DNA associated autoantigens can activate cells that express TLR7 or TLR9. So. Um, it was really quite remarkable when people went to start testing all of the in vitro data to find that, as we might have expected, if you knock out MITE 88 or if you knock out UNC93, that's the transporter protein that gets seven or nine to the endosomes, 
or a few of mice that are both seven and nine deficient, or even just seven deficient. In many different animal models of lupus, the disease improves, the mice are less sick. But invariably, if you look at mice that are only missing TLR9, the mice always get exacerbated accelerated disease, without a doubt, no matter what model you look at. And so the question is, well, what is the difference between TLR7 and TLR9, and why does TLR9 seem to be protective, and what does that have to do with B cells? So there have been a number of ideas put out there in terms of what 7 might be doing that's different from 9. Um, there was a paper uh, in JI from um, Ehlers that swoops, that suggested that B1 cells could make protective antibodies, and its ability to make protective antibodies was dependent on TLR9. I don't think that's the whole story, because you can certainly have this dominant uh, TLR9 protective antibody in bone marrow chimera mice, and they're not supposed to have B1 cells. And not only that, in our hands, B1 cells respond to TLR7 ligands just as well as to TLR9 ligands. So I'm not sure that that's the whole story. Um, there's also data from, oops, I'm going to keep on pressing this. Ah, okay, ignore that. I don't know why. Okay. How do I get to go away? Escape. Oops. What did I do? Oh, here. Okay, sorry. Okay, I'll try not to press that one again. Okay. So bottom line is um, that uh, um, I don't think that that's the case. Anyway, Mayaki uh, is uh, part of when he was in uh, Dr. Akira's group, now in his own, has shown that TLR7 and TLR9 can both bind to this UNC93 transporter protein, but that somehow TLR9 binds better, so it's a dominant binding. But how does that explain the difference between 7 or 9? It's not clear. Um, and Greg Barton, as I referred to earlier, has shown that TLR7 and TLR9 can traffic to different compartments. So maybe if they go to different compartments, they interact with different accessory molecules and can give rise to different downstream events. But basically, there's really nothing out there that's known that distinguishes a cell that's triggered through TLR7 versus a cell that's triggered through TR TLR9. And I think the initial assumption was that there were going to be some sort of suppressor cell that was TLR9 dependent that was controlling disease. However, Mark Somchek had a student, Kevin Nickerson, who noticed that if he took a 3H9, which is a DNA reactive transgenic B cell, that somehow those B cells survived longer in a TLR9 deficient mouse. And so in collaboration with Mike Cancro and in data that we've been talking about for a number of years now, we have shown that TLR9 activated cells, TLR9 activated B cells can go through a programmed cell death pathway that is not triggered through TLR7. But I'm not going to talk about that today. What I'd like to talk about is something a little bit um, more recent, which is basically the fact that TLR7-driven responses are very different from TLR9-driven responses in terms of what they do to the B cell. So let me basically explain my experimental system. Um, what we use, most of our work has been done with a B cell receptor transgenic line. Um, and the transgene in this case is a rheumatoid factor. So that's this receptor right here. And the reason we've chosen to do this is goes back um, from before I had kids, when I started my lab at Boston University, and we basically wanted to ask, well, what kinds of antibodies are made by mice that have lupus? So I, this is a very simple experiment. I took the spleen from an autoimmune mouse. I fused it. I made hybridoma proteins. And it turned out that in every single MRL LPR mouse that I looked at, 10 to 30 percent of the B cells had the specificity, which was basically an IgG anti-IgG which is, in fact, a rheumatoid factor. Now, it's a relatively low affinity interaction. So if you take these B cells, even though they see gamma 2A, they will circulate as naive B cells in mice that have circulating monomeric gamma 2A. So monomeric gamma 2A is not sufficient to engage this receptor. So you need an immune complex. What we found out, what Mark found out, is that if you put these B cells into mice that had lupus, they became activated. So we initially had the idea, well, if you have an immune complex, that's going to cross-link the receptor, and that's going to give you disease. Turns out that any immune complex doesn't work. The only immune complexes that will activate these cells are immune complexes that incorporate either DNA or RNA. And so here's an example over here on the left, which is 
a typical anti-DNA monoclonal antibody that could bind to DNA in some form of debris. You add this antibody to our B cells and they proliferate beautifully and it's dependent on TLR9. We also have antibodies that see RNA and we can add these antibodies to our B cells and they proliferate beautifully and that response is TLR7. Now what I should point out to you is that in each of these cases, we are simply adding the autoantibody to the culture. If I add an anti-TNP, nothing happens. If I add an autoantibody, it somehow sees some sort of cell debris in these cultures. And I can't show you the pictures here, but the proliferative response is as strong as if I were adding a CPG oligodeoxynucleotide. It's the, every single cell in the culture starts to divide. But if we're now trying to compare TLR7 and TLR9 signaling, which is something I'm going to try and show you in a minute, is it's hard to use this cell to this cell because be these autoantigens are black boxes. And I don't know how big they are, and I don't know what else is in the complex. So if I want to say that something is simply due to TLR7 or TLR9, it's hard to use the comparison of those two cells. So fortunately, we were able to come to the understanding that there are some autoantibodies that can bind both DNA-associated proteins and RNA-associated proteins. And one of those is this molecule, this autoantibody called PL2-3 that was given to us by um, uh, Mark Montesquieu many years ago. It was originally identified as an antihistone, but I can tell you that it can bind both a 9 ligand and a 7 ligand. And so what's the data? Basically, we have a genetic way of controlling which TLRs are expressed. We can take mice that are TLR9 deficient. They can only signal through TLR7, and under those conditions, this cell will proliferate and this cell will proliferate. If we look at a mouse that is TLR7 deficient, we can still get a TLR9 response through these two cells. If we're looking at mice that lack both TLRs, nobody responds to PL2-3. So that's, that's the system we can look at. Okay, so what does that tell us? Basically, if we put these rheumatoid factor B cells, that's what I'm going to call them, in culture, and we add a B cell survival factor like bliss, everybody is perfectly happy. They live just fine. And we can provide them with a TLR7 ligand or a TLR9 ligand, and they'll all divide. But what's interesting is that if you now wait three days using this PL2-3 antibody on wild-type rheumatoid factor cells, or TLR7 knockout cells. So this is the nine driven response if we have the seven knockout. And if we're looking for a plasma blast phenotype that we're identifying as CD138 positive, CD44 low, basically nothing happens. These cells that are nine driven are proliferating just fine. If we look over here now at the cell that is TLR9 deficient, so this is the TLR7 dependent response, they've turned into plasma blasts. So even though we can't really tell you yet exactly what's discriminating between those pathways, we know that intrinsic to the B cell, there's a very strong difference between TLR7 signaling and TLR9 signaling. And this is summarized down here. Um, we've carried this a, a little bit more to the molecular level. We've looked at the transcription factor IRF4. So IRF4, when it's expressed at high levels, is known to form dimers that can bind to a variety of genes involved in plasma blast differentiation. And what you can see here, again, is, oh, and let me just go back here for once. Oops, sorry, I'm going to go back. Maybe I'm not going to go back. Okay. I'm not, obviously not doing this here. Okay. You're just going to have to take my word for it. Um, actually, I bet I can go back here, right? Yeah. No. Okay. Sorry. Ah. Okay. Is there a way to back up? No? There we go. Okay. So the other thing I want to point out to you is that 1826 is a small molecule ligand for TLR9. CL97 is a small molecule ligand for TLR7. And even though these are small molecule ligands, and this is how most people study TLR signaling, we're not getting that plasma blast phenotype looking at the small molecules. So this plasma blast phenotype is unique to engaging the B cell receptor and TLR7 in the absence of TLR9. So this is an in vitro experiment. What happens if you now go um, and look at the molecular mechanism? As I mentioned, high levels of IRF4 are associated with this plasma blast phenotype. So what we're looking at here is levels of IRF4 is detected by cytoplasmic staining. 
And what you can see is that um, the gray bar is the basal level. That's the level of IL, uh, IR4 in unstimulated cells. The dotted line is what you see at 24 hours. So no matter what you do, PL2-3 in the wild type, seven knockouts, nine knockouts, at 24 hours, IR4 is up. But now if you look at 72 hours, high levels of IR4 are only maintained in the nine knockout that is the seven driven response. Again, consistent with this plasma blast phenotype. Okay, so now we decided we would go in vivo to see if this held up in vivo as well. And what we're doing here is we're taking mice, uh, we're transferring in our rheumatoid factor B cells of the different genotypes, and then we're adding either PBS or PL2-3. The cells that we inject are labeled with a fluorescent dye, so if they divide, they lose the dye, so you can see the loss of dye as an indication of proliferation. And what you can see is that if we transfer the cells into a mouse and give PBS, there's very little division. If we transfer in the cells and give this PL2-3 antibody, in the wild type and the seven knockout and the nine knockout, everybody divides. In the double knockout, there's much less division that's quantified over here. But what's interesting is that even though the cells have all divided, it's only the TLR9 deficient cells that are giving rise to LA spot positive plasma blast producing cells. So there's something very unique to TLR7 that distinguishes it from TLR9 inherent to the B cells that's involved in autoantibody production. Okay, so that's what I just told you in the absence of TLR9, RNA associated immune complexes induce these rheumatoid factor B cells to differentiate into this plasma blast lineage. In vivo, both the RNA and DNA associated complexes drive the cells to divide, but again, it's the RNA associated complexes that induce these IgG antibody forming cells, and that tells us that there's a B cell intrinsic role for TLR9 as a negative regulator of autoreactive B cell differentiation. Now, what I will tell you, and I'm not going to show you because um, it became a little bit too complicated, is what TLR9 does do. It doesn't upregulate IRF4, it upregulates IRF8. And IRF8 deficient mice develop autoimmune disease, their B cells have a break in energy, they spontaneously start producing anti DNA antibodies. So I think that may be a connection that we're interested in following up on. Okay, so that's all for toll like receptors. There are other kinds. I'm sorry? No effect on regular B cell stimulation? No. No. Okay. Cytosolic nucleic sensors. Here we go. Okay. So there are all the endosomal nucleic acid sensors, but what's become apparent in the last few years is that there are also RNA and DNA sensors that exist in the cytosol. The RNA sensors are molecules such as uh, RIGI or MDA5. They seem to somehow bind uh, RNA that's in the cytosol, signal through this protein MAVs that's associated with mitochondria, then through TBK, through IRF3 to give you type 1 interferons and under some conditions pro-inflammatory cytokines as well. There's also a whole class of DNA cytosolic sensors uh, that include IFI204, DI, DX, these DDX proteins, probably a whole bunch of DNA sensors that exist in the cytosol. Um, there's beautiful work from James Chen in the last couple of years showing that there's also this DNA sensor C-gas that uh, can take DNA and break it into dinucleotides, these uh, cyclic dinucleotides that can then bind to a molecule called sting, which is basically the focal point for the DNA sensors, and that once you've activated sting, you can also work through TBK1 or through this NF-kappa B pathway to give rise to pro-inflammatory cytokines and type 1 interferons. So again, the same sorts of things that the endosomal receptors can do, these nucleic acid sensors can do. And it turns out, and this was surprising to me, that um, what we're basically looking at, these are not my data but what's in the gene banks, that there are certain cells that express TLR7 and certain cells that express sting, and B cells make just as much sting as uh, they make uh, TLR7. So, so B cells are a potential sting-driven response. So the question is, is sting under any circumstances contributing to the autoantibody response, and does it in any way uh, contribute to the kinds of autoantibodies that you see in lupus? Okay, so how do, the, how do the nucleic acids get into the cytosol? So basically there are two routes that have been described. There's beautiful work from Dan Stetson who has argued that there are all sorts of retro elements that are con 
sort of uh, spontaneously transcribed um, and then incorporated back into different chromosomes, and there's this sort of constant turnover of retro elements uh, in the cytosol. And um, the level of these intermediary nucleic acids can be controlled by a variety of enzymes that can break down um, these uh, nucleic acids. And perhaps the best described is one called TREX1 that's known to decrade these retro elements or viral uh, nucleic acids that accumulate in the cytosol. Uh, there's also a model that's been described by Nagata using uh, a mouse that is missing this enzyme called DNase2. DNase2 is a DNase that is present in phagosomes, and when cells take up or when phagocytes take up apoptotic debris, DNase2 is needed to break down the nucleic acids in order for the phagocyte to clear the debris properly. And in the absence of DNase2, these uh, overloaded phagosomes somehow leak out their contents into the cytosol and are able to activate these uh, nucleic acid sensors. Okay, and so again, we have endogenous ligands for all of these uh, uh, cytosolic sensors uh, that can, again, work through uh, sting to activate both pro-inflammatory cytokines and type 1 interferons. And there are a variety of diseases that are associated um, with these different kinds of mutations. I've already talked about the TLRs and lupus. So a mouse that overexpresses TLR7 or it's a transgenic or a YA or is lacking TLR9 will develop SLE, and if, you miss, if you're missing any of these molecules, um, that prevents uh, SLE. There are certain TREX1 mutations that have been associated with uh, lupus, and there are TREX1 mutations and mutations in some of the other enzymes that I showed you that are controlling these retro elements that can give rise to um, a, a, an infantile or a neonatal inflammatory neuropathy called a Cardi Gutierrez syndrome, or in some cases, Chilobane lucas. So, this is the, the TREX mutation uh, pathway that's been perhaps the best defined. Um, there are TREX1 knockout mice now that develop not a Cardi Gutierrez, it's not clear why not, but they do develop myocarditis, myositis, gastritis, dermatitis, and the way you can essentially eliminate those. Uh, disease symptoms is by crossing the TREX1 knockout to the sting knockout. So again, it's this idea that you have retro elements. If they're not properly cleared by the DNases, they now engage these nucleic acid sensors that work through sting that give rise uh, to disease. And most of this disease is thought to be mediated by the type 1 interferon arm because if you cross the TREX1 knockouts to mice that are missing the type 1 interferon receptor, uh, the disease also goes away. And then there's this DNase2 knockout that I mentioned, which I think is particularly interesting. DNase2 knockout mice on their own are embryonic lethal. They develop this anemia due to very high levels of type 1 interferon. If you cross them to a mouse that's missing the type 1 interferon receptor, they now develop an interesting form of inflammatory arthritis, which goes away if you now add sting and make the triple knockout. So again, there are all of these diseases that seem to be associated with the cytosolic sensors, the question is, are these cytosolic sensors contributing to lupus? And so the way we decided to ask that question was to basically take one of our autoimmune-prone mice, MRL LPR mice, and cross them to sting-deficient mice and see what would happen. So the idea is, again, um, given that this, these cytosolic sensors give you pro-inflammatory cytokines and type 1 interferons, enzymes that are known to drive lupus, what's going to happen? Um, so our prediction, based on what we knew, namely that the endosomal TLRs and sting are expressed in B cells, PDCs, and macrophages, uh, that they both class as nucleic acid sensors drive type 1 interferon receptors, and interferon's important uh, in SLE. Certain TREX mutations are linked to SLE, which would suggest there's an increase in endogenous ligands. Um, so the prediction was that both of them would contribute to disease pathogenesis and that our sting-deficient MRL LPR mice would have less severe disease. But that's not what happened. Uh, instead, if you now look at this, this, these are spleens now from mice that are only four to five months old. The, this is the size of an LPR spleen at this stage. This is the size of the sting-deficient LPR spleen at this stage. 
And here are the lymph nodes. There's no doubt that the sting mice have much uh, greater splenomegaly lymphadenopathy. Um, just in terms of spleen weight or lymph node weight. Um, one of the characteristics of MRLL pair mice is they have an unusual T cell subset that expresses the B220 marker. So wild type mice have very few cells here. Uh, your typical LPR mouse would have a certain number of cells in this category. And here are your sting LPRs. Tons of mice, in this, tons of cells in this double negative category. Um, if you look at autoantibodies, the sting LPR mice shown on the right here have much higher autoantibody titers. Oh, jeez. Let's see if I can at least get rid of it myself. Okay. So these, um, these sting knockout mice have much higher autoantibody titers compared to age-matched LPRs. Um, and they have, uh, actually, there's one other thing I want to show you. Sorry. Okay. But the one thing I want to point out is that if you look at an IRF3 deficient mouse, there's no effect. So whatever is happening here in the sting pathway is, in fact, independent of IRF3. Okay. Okay. And they also, these LPR mice, have a much increased myeloid compartment identified by CD11B, and they have a lot more activated granulocytes and macrophages, and they die a lot more quickly. So how do we account for all this? It turns out that sting appears to negatively regulate TLR responses in myeloid lineage cells. So what we're looking at, for example, uh, right here, this is, we're comparing a regular B6 mouse to a sting deficient mouse. This is um, a ligand for sting, so we can show you that the mice really are what they're supposed to be. But now if we're looking at responses to CPG, a TLR7 ligand or a TLR9 ligand or a TLR3 ligand, what you can see is that the responses of the sting knockouts are much higher than the control group. So somehow sting is negatively regulating these responses. So how is it doing that? Well, it turns out there are a number of molecules that are known to be negative regulators of the TLR pathway, like A20, and they are down in the sting deficient mice. There's also another negative feedback loop that's been implicated in uh, systemic disease, and that's the IDO pathway. IDO is a tryptophan derivative that's known to activate uh, regulatory T cells. And what you can see is that where you have plenty of IDO positive cells in a wild type LPR mouse, in the sting-deficient LPR mouse, all of those um, IDO-producing cells are gone. So there's this whole unexpected pathway whereby something that should be a feed-forward loop because it can activate sensors actually, when you put it together with lupus, activates the negative side of things. And so it tells us that we have to be very careful when we look at what we think drives disease. And um, so basically, the reason this is important is because there are a number of companies, uh, biotech companies, that are interested in developing sting inhibitors for the treatment of patients with these Accardi Gutierrez like diseases. Uh, and it's important to keep in mind that therapeutics designed to negate the effects of sea gas and other nucleic acid sting dependent pathways may have unintended consequences and perturb a carefully orchestrated balance between the cytosolic and endosomal signaling cascades, okay? So that's, that's this part of the story. Okay, one more quick little DNA story here. So that's basically what I told you, is that sting can negatively regulate lupus. And I'll skip this one for now. Okay, so we wanted to sort of do the other side of the coin, which was to ask, okay, if you have one of these sting-driven diseases and you knock out the TLR pathway, what is gonna happen? And so this DNA IFNAR mouse is the one that develops arthritis, it had been reported that the DNAs IFNAR mice, if you cross them to a TLR9 deficient mouse, that they still develop arthritis. But it turns out that these DNAs IFNAR mice have a much more complicated disease than the inflammatory arthritis that they've mainly been studied for. Um, so again, this is this arm of the pathway activating where if you don't have DNAs too, all these, uh, the apoptotic debris, the nucleic acid, uh, leaches out of the phagosomes and can activate uh, these cytosolic sensors and give rise to this pathway. Um, but keep in mind that this is a phagosome and the phagosomes can also have uh, TLRs, which could also contribute to the disease. Okay, so this is pictures of the arthritis. Uh, 
basically, um, these are the DNAs IFNAR mice. You can see that they have swollen paws. This is work from Nagata. Uh, if you cross them, um, if you compare them to just the IFNAR mice, there is not much going on there in terms of arthritis. Um, if you now look at this histologically, and this is done in collaboration with uh, Ellen Gravelisi um, at uh, BU, basically you can see this inflamed synovium in the DNA's IFNAR mice. Uh, these are the controls. These are the DNA's heterozygotes, so they seem to be just fine. If you look at the double knockouts in combination with the sting knockout, you can see that this inflammation is gone. And if you look at the UNC93 triple knockouts, the inflammation is still there. So that's everything that's been described in the context of the disease. But these DNA's IFNAR mice also make autoantibodies. And again, what had been reported in the literature was that they made anti-CCP. In our hands, or at least in our colony, they don't make anti-CCP. Uh, they had also been reported to make rheumatoid factor. In our colony, or at least using our assays, and I think we know how to measure rheumatoid factor, they don't make anti rheumatoid factor. They were also reported to make anti-double-stranded DNA. Um, and again, that was done using a double-stranded uh, DNA ELISA. And I just want to point out that DNA is a highly charged molecule, and in our hands at least, when you try and set up these ELISA assays where you coat the well with double-stranded DNA, basically I think what you're measuring is total antibody titer because so much sticks to those assays nonspecifically. So I don't put a lot of faith in those. I'd much prefer to look at a real uh, ANA. And when you look at these DNA SIFNARs, you get this staining pattern, which is basically an anti-nucleolar staining pattern, which in our hands uh, we also sometimes see in our lupus patients, and we consider this a TLR7-driven antibody response. But I just showed you that these mice, you know, you're activating sting, and sting can give rise to type 1 interferon, and sting is in B cells. So the question was, if you now look at the sting knockouts, can you make autoantibodies in a TLR independent fashion if you're activating these other pattern recognition receptors? And the answer is no. Even in the sting deficient mice, making the card carrying lupus associated ANA antibodies is entirely TLR7 or 9 dependent. And the other interesting twist to all of it is that the DNAs IFNAR mice develop these gigantic spleens. They develop these gigantic spleens because there are problems in the bone marrow in terms of generating red blood cells. I think many of you are familiar with the fact that as the last stage of red blood cell differentiation, nuclei are extruded and they're taken up by the special category of macrophages that sit in the bone marrow. If those macrophages don't have DNAs too, they can't degrade the nuclei, and basically the whole red blood cell lineage gets backed up in the bone marrow, so they move to the spleen uh, for extramedullary hematopoiesis. But what's interesting is that these DNAs IFNAR deficient mice in the UNC93, so in mice that can't signal through TLR, that whole enlarged spleen has disappeared. So UNC93 is doing, or TLRs are doing more than just contributing to autoantibody. They're contributing to other aspects of the disease in this model, including what's, you know, the clearance of the apoptotic debris. Um, and um, also uh, in terms of looking for act in, in these DNAs, if in our mice you get activated T cells that you don't see in the UNC93 knockouts. But in both kinds of mice you get this very expanded myeloid lineage. So there are parts of the disease that are sting dependent and there's part of the disease that's TLR dependent. So in essence it works both ways. So that's sort of the nucleic acid side of things. I'm going to take just two minutes or maybe five minutes here to tell you a little bit about our pulmonary fibrosis story. So completely different off topic, but here we go. Fibrosis, I don't think I need to tell you, is the excess deposition of connective tissue uh, in response in many cases to chronic injury and inflammation. So I'm going to be talking about pulmonary fibrosis, so basically a lung injury model that can give rise to inflammation, which is then thought to eventually uh, promote fibrosis. And the reason I'm interested in this is because whereas systemic lupus can be considered an inflammatory disease, systemic sclerosis can be considered more of a fibrotic disease. What distinguishes one from the other isn't clear. Um, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis is the most common type of interstitial lung disease. We heard about this morning that it can also be part of RA and some of the other systemic autoimmune diseases. Uh, people with these fibrotic diseases have very poor prognosis. 
Uh, and in fact, there's not much that can be done to treat them. And the general pathogenesis is thought to be epithelial injury to activation and elaboration of these fibroblastic foci, and eventually the fibroblasts take over and it's just out of control. And uh, the point I want to make here is that obviously fibrosis, the process of fibrosis is a very complicated process. It has an innate component, it has an adaptive component, it has a fibroblast component. But the adaptive component is considered mainly to be a Th2 IL-13 producing cell that somehow contributes to fibroblast activation. Okay, so TGF-beta has been implicated in fibrosis, comes from macrophages. This whole uh, Th2 CD4 cells and maybe CD8 TC2 cells in terms of IL-13 production. And also Th17 cells have now been identified in the early stages of fibrosis. So the model that we look at is a bleomycin injury model where here's your naive mouse and you can see in mice that have been treated intratracheally with bleomycin um, using a Mason's trichrome stain, you see all of this uh, fibrosis uh, building up. Uh, again, the idea is there's epithelial damage that leads to immune activation that leads to fibrosis. And various investigators have shown that Th17 cells are important early in the disease process and that Th2 cells are important later in the disease process. But nobody has really understood what the link is that connects these two parts of the disease. And so this was the work of an MD-PhD student in my lab, uh, Tia Bumpus, who basically decided that she knew what the answer was, what connected all of this. Um, she figured that IL-21 was a cytokine that's made by Th17 cells, and it's known to promote the survival of Th2 cells, and so that IL-21 would end up being important in fibrosis. Um, and so basically she walked across the street to Susie Swain and asked for some, because I didn't think this was ever going to work, so I was going to let her uh, play with this. Bottom line is she got some uh, IL-21 receptor deficient mice from Susie. And what she was able to show, and you can, if you look carefully at the histology here, you can see it. Here's your normal lung. Um, this is your bleomycin lung. And what you can see here is both inflammation and then all of this pink over here is fibrosis. If you look at the IL-21 receptor knockout mice, you still have inflammation, but what you're missing is the fibrosis. And you can see that you have the inflammation because if you look at the total number of cells in the bowel fluid, in the wild type and in the IL-21 knockout mice, it's just as high. If you look at the number of cells that accumulate in the draining lymph node in both the wild type and the IL-21 knockout mice, they're the same. But if you look for fibrosis in the bleomycin-treated mice, it's gone. She has an assay for measuring total lung collagen. This is a circle assay. And you can see that comparing the bleomycin B6 mice to the bleomycin IL-21 receptor knockout mice, uh, that this is gone as well. If you're looking for smooth muscle actin as a marker of activated fibroblasts, that's an immunohistology over here in the wild type mice. There's no smooth muscle actin made in the IL-21 receptor knockout mice. And if you give a higher dose of bleomycin, you can see that the B6 mice die and the IL-21 receptor mice don't die. So Tia went on to ask, well, what is it exactly about the IL-21 mice that is really making the difference? And so she took uh, the lung draining lymph nodes from these mice, or she's done it also with the uh, bowel fluid cells. She takes the cells, she activates them for a day or two um, in vitro, and what she can show is that both the wild type and the IL-21 receptor knockout mice still make IL-17, but there's a big difference in terms of how much IL-13 is produced. When she looked to see what kinds of cells were coming into the lung, I showed you that you still get inflammation. You still get the inflammatory influx. You get the same number of CD4 cells. That was actually surprising. But what she noticed was that the number of CD8 cells was way down. And then when she went to ask, well, who is it that normally makes the IL-13 in these lung-draining lymph nodes? So this is basically a stain for IL-13, and this is a stain for CD8. And what you can see very clearly is that in the BLEO-B6 mice, the cells that are actually making the IL-13 are the CD8 cells, and those cells are essentially gone in the IL-21 receptor knockout mice so that you get a lot less in terms of IL-13 production if you knock out IL-21. 
Now, so what is the data to suggest that CD8s are important? I mean, I think when we talk about autoimmune disease, for the most part, people focus on CD4 cells, but there is data in the literature to suggest that CD8 cells are important in systemic sclerosis. Uh, CD8 cells uh, have been identified. Uh, they're increased, um, and they are actually making IL-13 in the peripheral blood of patients with systemic sclerosis. If you take the soups from these cells and add them to fibroblasts, you can show that you activate a STAT6-dependent pathway in those fibroblasts. And if you look in the lungs of patients with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, you actually see significant increase in the number of CD8 cells, not the number of CD4 cells. Um, now, what was interesting um, is that separate and apart from injecting bleomycin into the lungs, you can also just inject IL-21 into these mice, and you still get these CD8 cells that are making IL-13. Um, and this is quantified over here in terms of just total lung collagen. Uh, so Tia then decided to ask, well, what is it that drives CD8 cells to become these IL-13 producing cells? And those of you who are familiar with T cell biology remember that in order to drive a typical CD4 or TH2 cell, you use IL-2 and IL-4. And IL-2 and IL-4 will activate um, CD4 cells to make IL-13, but it turns out if you look at CD8 cells, IL-21 and IL-4 do an even better job, and if you block the high affinity IL-2 receptor, you get even more of these CD8 IL-13 producing cells. Um, it was interesting because TGF-beta blocks this effect, TGF-beta in combination with IL-4. If you're looking at IL-21 receptor expression on CD8 cells, if you just add TGF-beta, you get plenty of IL-21. If you add IL of the IL-21 receptor. IL-4 and TGF-beta completely shut down IL-21 receptor expression. And so this is the last part of the story, which I think is perhaps the most interesting, which is um, if, you, um, if you take just naive CD8 cells and put them in culture, anti-CD3, together with either IL-21 alone, IL-4, or the combination of IL-4 and IL-21, you get all of these CD8 cells that are making IL-13. But if you use CD8 cells that come from an IL-21 knockout, this isn't the receptor knockout, these are CD8 cells that can't make the cytokine, you completely lose that ability to make IL-13. So what that's telling you is that you need a source of IL-21 to start the process, but then these CD8 cells start to make their own IL-21, which is a feed-forward loop that drives this process. Um, and Here's the evidence that the cells, in fact, are making their own IL-21. So if the CD8 cells are stimulated with IL-21 and IL-24 and then washed and then stimulated with anti-CD3, they make their own IL-21. Okay, so what's the final proof, the in vivo data, that this is even important? So this is the last experiment that Tia did, which was basically to take IL-21 receptor deficient mice. So you give those mice bleomycin, you're going to get inflammation, but you're not going to get fibrosis. What she did was then reconstitute those mice with CD8 cells from a wild type or um, a, a, a deficient mouse. And basically what you can see here, she did this experiment in lots of different ways. I'll focus on this one right here. So these are the IL-21 deficient mice, and we're looking at collagen production. That's the basal level. These are the IL-21 receptor knockouts, so even when you give them bleomycin, there's no collagen. If you reconstitute with CD4 cells, you really don't get much in terms of collagen. But if you basically give these IL-21 receptor knockout mice 2 million wild-type CD8 cells, you completely recover the fibrotic phenotype, both in terms of collagen production and in terms of inflammation and fibrosis, because again, you've recovered that smooth muscle actin stain. So basically what I've shown you in this last part is that IL-21 receptor signaling is dispensable for inflammation after bleomycin injury, but it's required for fibrosis, that optimal CD8 T cell recruitment to the lung is dependent on IL-21, that IL-21 deficiency attenuates IL-13 production mainly by CD8 T cells after injury, and that this combination of IL-21 and IL-4 promotes IL-13 and IL-21 production by these CD8 cells. Uh, 
um, this IL-21 becomes this autocrine feedback loop for keeping these CD8 cells alive, and that if you adoptively transfer IL-21 sufficient, IL-21 receptor sufficient CD8 cells into the knockout mice, you can completely recover that fibrotic phenotype. So here's our new way of thinking about it, which is Th17 cells or perhaps some other source of cell in the lung produces enough IL-21 in combination with IL-4 to basically drive the activation of these TC2 cells that then start to make both IL-13, which can cause fibrosis, but also this autocrine IL-21 feedback loop, which certainly keeps these cells alive and may also have direct effects um, on the fibroblasts. Okay, so basically I just want to thank everybody who uh, contributed to the data I've shown you. All the work on the TLRs is done by a postdoc in my lab, now instructor uh, Kirsten Nundel. Uh, the fibrosis story was by uh, Tia Bumpus. The cytosolic sensors are done in collaboration. All that work is done in collaboration with Kate Fitzgerald and her uh, postdoc, Shruti uh, Sharma. Ellen's helped with all of the rheumatology. And there are a number of collaborators that we've worked with throughout the years. I won't go through that. Thank you very much. So any, any quick questions? I'm happy to. Yeah. So what are the CD8 cells seeding? So that's a really good question. So I will tell you our one preliminary data. We, well, we've done this twice. I'm not sure I believe it yet. When we did those reconstitution experiments, we used RAG-deficient OT1 CD8 cells because we wanted to show that we needed a polyclonal repertoire. We didn't think the ex expectation was that these cells would do nothing. And in fact, the OT1 RAG-reconstituted mice now developed fibrosis. So what that might tell us, it's not, you know, again, it needs to be done a little bit more carefully, is that it's the cytokine environment in the lung that's activating these cells nonspecifically, and we don't necessarily need a T cell recognition of a specific antigen, that it's sensing the environment, not the antigen. Now, you might say that that's completely off the charts because everybody knows that T cells need to see antigen, but I'll remind you that B cells can be activated beautifully by the combination of Bliss and IL-21. They'll divide just fine. So there is this precedent that IL-21 can actually activate lymphocytes through receptor independent mechanisms, and I think that's something we really have to start thinking about in terms of what we think lymphocytes do and how they contribute to disease. If you look in uh, other forms of fibrosis, uh, like acuoidal fibrosis in the so, skin, do you know whether this system applies when it's IL-21 TC2? So we haven't, I mean, this is really just the beginning of the project in my lab, but I showed this um, data to uh, one of my students, former students who now works at Metamune. They're very interested in graft-versus-host disease, in fibrotic graft-versus-host disease, and there's a whole literature, believe it or not, saying that IL-21 is important in, you know, chronic graft-versus-host disease and the fibrotic response there. So we haven't gone back to do that, but I think it may actually apply to you know, other instances. We'd love to look in other models. We, we actually just uh, published a, a paper showing IL-17 uh, role in fibrosis in the cardiac uh, inflammatory disease, so I find it very fascinating and we will definitely look at IL-21. It'll be interesting to see, yeah. So thank you so much. Mm -hmm. So I would like to introduce our second speaker. Um, this is Dr. Marsha Ross Karp, who is a professor and uh, chief of department on environmental scientist here in School of uh, Public Health in the John Hopkins University. Uh, before her tenure here, 
she was a professor and founding director in the Division of Immunopathology in Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical Center. And this is, of course, not her first faculty position here in John Hopkins. She has been a faculty here for a decade before. And I would like to also mention that her PhD she received from uh, Un University of California, Santa Barbara, and her master's degree for University of uh, Southwest Texas uh, State, State University. Um, Dr. Marshall Ross Karp, um, lifelong research interest in understanding of pathogenesis of asthma, and she has made uh, multiple discoveries in this area. I would like to mention just a few. So she's, of course, uh, help us in understanding of role of TH2 cells and cytokines in the pathogenesis of asthma. She has been instrumental in discovery that complement mediated regulation of IL-17A axis is driving pathogenesis of severe uh, childhood past asthma. She has identified several, uh, several putative genes in childhood asthma. And recently, her focus shifted in the role of a microbiota in the pathogenesis of asthma, and we are looking forward to her today's talk. Thank you very much for that very generous introduction. I didn't quite expect that, but thank you so much. So uh, like our keynote speaker, everything I'm going to show you today is unpublished. This is sort of my pet project of the moment. So again, it's not all fully uh, a full story yet. It's a work in progress. Uh, but then I want to leave you with one thing at the end that hopefully people will pay attention to that has relevance to anyone who's working with mice. So uh, this is a departure from your theme. I'm really not going to talk about autoimmunity per se, but hopefully some of the uh, things that I'm going to show you might be relevant to some other models. Uh, okay, am I doing this? All right. So since I didn't have a long time, I kind of skipped some of the introductory materials about asthma because I think most of you probably have some idea of what asthma is. It's a chronic inflammatory disease of the lung. Uh, we generally think of it as being driven by immune responses to antigens uh, that drive Th2 uh, inflammation. And we've spent many years trying to work out that pathway, and I think we can conclude it's, it's pretty solidly an IL-13-driven process. But what we've uh, come to appreciate over the last five or 10 years, excuse me, <clears throat> that asthma is more complex, perhaps, than just a single disease. And your garden variety asthma may be IL-13-driven, but recent studies with antibodies to IL-13 have shown that there are some patients that blocking IL-13 works remarkably well for, but not for all asthmatics, suggesting it's more complicated and there are other uh, processes that probably play a role. So that sort of piqued our interest in the role of TH17 in asthma, and studies from our lab and others, and particularly in human disease, have shown that when you have a combination of TH2 and TH17 cytokines, you have more severe disease. So the two together give you a more severe phenotype. Relevant to what you were talking about, we've shown that there's synergy downstream between the two cytokines and that they can activate each other. But that synergy only goes in one direction, not the other. Uh, surprisingly, it's, it's only between IL-13 and IL-17. IL-17 doesn't regulate IL-13 in, in our hands, but it's a, a different model. So one of the questions that we have overall, and this relates to your theme of autoimmunity and, and allergic diseases, is we all know that there's been this dramatic increase in all of these chronic inflammatory diseases, whether they're autoimmune or allergic or, or others. And so our interest in asthma has really been spurred by this dramatic increase in disease, which really doesn't seem to be leveling off that much. It's continuing to increase, particularly in certain segments of, of uh, society. But what's interesting here is that both what we think of as TH1, TH17, TH2-driven diseases are all going up at the same time. So why is that? You know, there were a hypothesis early on that suggested particular things that were changing with parasites, et cetera. I think that it's too simple to suggest it's a change in any one particular T-cell subset. But there clearly are things that are changing, perhaps in the environment, uh, 
that are leading to increases in all these T-cell-driven diseases. So in regards to asthma in particular, we know there are genetic influences, but there's not any one single gene that's strongly associated. There are polymorphisms in IL-13, IL-33 that are associated with disease, uh, but they're not as striking as in some autoimmune diseases where you have HLA genes that are dominant uh, uh, susceptibility. There are about 23 different genes that have been associated with asthma. And it, even if you look at twins, there's not a good concordance. So we know there are environmental factors that are playing a role. And hence, being in an environmental uh, health department, uh, I clearly have to pay attention to this. But some of the factors that we know have been associated with disease are exposures or allergens, per se. And we, we do think that the origin of the disease is a response or ab aberrant response to allergen uh, sensitization and challenge. But there are other influences that either help promote that or can exacerbate disease, such as various viruses, uh, fungal infections, air pollutants, uh, environmental tobacco smoke. Uh, and many of those have been well characterized and worked out. Uh, but more recently, uh, the focus has changed to perhaps gut flora. So some of the factors that have changed in our environment are, are shown here. We know that kind of tracking with some of these increases in disease or the increased use of antibiotics, this clearly can change uh, the set point for the gut flora in terms of uh, working at a pediatric hospital before coming back here. Some of my pediatric uh, colleagues said that they're some of their patients had had four or five courses of antibiotics before they were two years of age. Now, this is a dramatic effect on the gut uh, 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 flora. Breastfeeding, there had been a reduction in breastfeeding, and breastfeeding is very protective for asthma. So that reduction that you see in the Western world has been associated with increased incidence and in susceptibility to disease. One that's particularly interesting to me uh, particularly because of the short time period of the exposure is cesarean birth. There are numerous studies now showing an increased risk of asthma with cesarean births. And cesarean births have been dramatically increasing in the Western world over the last 10 years or so. So that's only a short time that you're exposed to the mother's uh, microflora. But that is probably the strongest relationship out of the three of those in terms of susceptibility to asthma. So all of that had been sort of put together in terms of the hygiene hypothesis and within the Western world, but also comparing uh, high-income uh, Western world versus developing countries, people had felt that exposure to more bacteria was protective. And that's been a little bit hard to prove uh, because, as we know, you can say bacteria, but, you know, there's a whole host of bacteria. And when you're trying to lump it all into bacteria per se, it doesn't hold up that well. Um, if you, there have been some studies trying to look at specific types of bacterial exposures that have been protective. There were early reports that BCG vaccination in most of the world was protective, but that, that probably isn't true, doesn't hold, hold up. Hepatitis A, also in the third world, exposures were thought to be protective, but none of these have really held up. Uh, and overt viral infections and others have not shown any kind of protection. There are animal studies where antibiotic-treated mice and germ-free mice have enhanced disease, not suppressed disease, okay? So we don't know if this is a lack of protective bacteria or a loss of bacteria that are driving the enhanced disease. We don't know in which direction this error goes. You know, there are so many different bacteria that probably have different effects. And so the idea has been to try to look at a broader view and look at the microbiome or microbiota in these models. But uh, and in humans, there has been several studies now, and this is just one of them, showing changes in the microbiota of allergic people on the left versus non-allergic on the right. And what you see is an increase in the firmicutes and particularly the clostridia and a decrease in the bifidobacteria family uh, or the phyla. Uh, 
And this has been uh, pretty much reproduced also in the lungs of asthmatics versus normals and in a couple other studies. Uh, in the lungs, it's a little bit more complicated because we really haven't seen the extensive colonization of bacterial colonization in the lungs, but you inhale bits and pieces of bacteria and things constantly. So this may be the presence of these organisms, but maybe not overt colonization. So that's a little bit trickier, but the data in the GI tract seem to hold up uh, pretty well across studies. So we got interested in this from the study that many of you are probably familiar with uh, uh, by Dan Littman's group on the SFB story. And we were looking at IL-17 at, at that point in time because we had been evaluating the, the role of IL-17 in severe asthma and showing that IL-17 was really important in severe forms of disease. So when he came out with this study showing that you could buy mice from two different suppliers that were genetically identical and get different levels of TH17 cytokine production. We were quite interested by that, and we decided to pursue this in, in the same model that he had. He did a series of really elegant studies to show that uh, the mice that came from Jackson Labs had low gut TH17 cells, and these were not in any particular disease model. They were just in general, the basal levels of TH17 cells. And he found in that instance there was no gut colonization with this segmented filamentous bacteria. And you can see this bacteria, it's the filaments here coming out of the uh, gut epithelium, and it forms this coat over uh, the mucosal surface. He then showed also that in the taconic mice uh, that come from taconic far farms, they had high gut TH17 levels, and that was nicely associated with the SFB, the presence of it in the gut. Now, SFB is quite an unusual organism. Uh, it belongs to, loosely to the Clostridia family, has a unique lifestyle. It's gut tropic. It's, it's a, a anaerobe, so you wouldn't be likely to see it in the lungs in a highly oxygenated environment. It's gram positive, and you cannot culture it. And one of the reasons why people have uh, solved the, uh, the, the genome of this organism, it's missing a number of key enzymes for uh, oxidative phosphorylation. So it seems to be totally dependent on other cells or organisms for survival. And that's probably why you can't culture it in a dish without anything else. So it seems to require this interaction with the gut epithelium. A number of uh, papers have shown in uh, other models of autoimmunity, EAE, inflammatory bowel disease, and uh, arthritis model uh, that SFB seems to be associated with severity in those conditions, the presence of SFB. So we had a look at it, and indeed we replicated what Dan had reported, that in fact there are really high levels of SFB in the intestines of the taconic mice. And you can see we did a, a gram stain here, and you can see the segmented filamentous bacteria. There's one really interesting thing about this organism, is that as soon as the mouse or human um, develops their own functional IgA levels, this bacteria is completely cleared. So it's only resident in the gut early in life before you have normal IgA. So that'll be important to some of the things I want to tell you. So we took our model of asthma, which is house dust mite sensitization via the airways, no IP injections, no adjuvants, and we measure airway reactivity here on the left, and we compared the Jackson mice that don't have the SFB with those from Taconic. And it's the same protocol with both, and again, reminding you they're genetically identical. The only thing that had been shown different uh, in them so far had been the presence of this single bacteria. We see that the uh, airway reactivity is about double in those mice that have colonization with this SFB in their gut. And there's a huge increase in neutrophils, and uh, no difference, if in anything, there are more eosinophils in the mice that don't have as severe airway reactivity showing you there's really no connection here with the TH2 response. It's likely TH17. Uh, there are no changes in IgE or mucus in these as well. 
So uh, consistent with that, there were no changes in IL-5 or IL-13, the Th2 cytokines, but we saw a huge increase in IL-17A production in those mice that were colonized with the SFB and were hyper-responsive. So to show you, getting back to this point that they clear this organism early in life, you could see here on the left that this is it looking at SFB in the GI tract over time. And by 11 or 12 weeks, they basically don't have any anymore. Without any kind of treatments, this is just spontaneous clearance. Tracks with their IgA antibody production. But you can see, though, that the presence of the Th17 cells persist. So long after this organism is gone, you've still got a tendency to make more IL-17 producing cells. So that doesn't really tell you anything because that was just a correlation. So what we did do, you can obtain SFB from some monocolonized mice uh, by a group in Japan. And they'll send you the fecal material and you basically do a fecal transplant uh, on the mice and then we challenge them with our, our allergen challenge. So the first thing we show is that this, this transplant actually works and they become colonized. So we took the non-SFB colonized mice and transferred SFB into them. When we did that, they became hyper-responsive and uh, produced more IL-17A, showing you that SFB is able to drive the IL-17 and the hyper-responsiveness in the mice that weren't normally colonized. All right, and just to prove that this is IL, the hyper-responsiveness is IL-17 driven, we blocked uh, IL-17A with an antibody we got from Amgen, and it returns them to their normal level of airway reactivity and suppresses uh, the cellular response, which is mainly neutrophils. So what might be going on here? Why is it that gut colonization can drive this Th17 response in enhancement of airway reactivity in another organ? Uh, whoops. So we know that many factors are required to get uh, Th17 differentiation, IL-6, TGF-beta, IL-1-beta, and IL-23 is necessary for their survival. So we compared those in tissues from the Taconic and Jackson mice. What we basically showed is that there were really no difference, between, any significant differences between IL-1 beta, IL-6, uh, but there were in IL-23 and IL-10. Colonization with SFB seemed to drive IL-23, and the lack of it seemed to skew towards an IL-10 or tolerogenic response. So there was this dichotomy between IL-23 and IL-10 uh, driven by the colonization with SFB. This phenotype was also long-lived, so long after that SFB had been cleared, the dendritic cells from the bone marrow still had this tendency to be skewed towards this um, uh, TH17 promoting pathway and then suppressing IL-10 production. This suggested to us that there must be some sort of conditioning or permanent change in the bone marrow cells to be able just to pull these out from the mice that the only thing had been done to them was simply that they were endogenously uh, colonized with the SFB. So it suggests that this is some kind of epigenetic or conditioning effect on the bone marrow cells themselves. So we asked whether taking those DCs from the mice that had been conditioned with SFB or not could actually transfer that allergic disease. And so we took uh, bone marrow cells from the Jackson mice that normally don't have SFB or the taconic, transferred them into the SFB-free mouse and looked to see whether the in vivo conditioning could drive the allergic response. And in fact, it does. If we took the ones from taconic, which are the SFB colonized, you see you get the increased airway reactivity, neutrophilia, and IL-17 production. So this was just taking the dendritic cells that had just been pulsed with LPS, no other treatments. The only differences is, are that this, these are uh, conditioned in vivo with SFB. So what might be going on here? It suggests that something's being made in the gut 
in response to the SFB colonization. And it's likely that that factor must be soluble to be having effects on the bone marrow and changing the set point of bone marrow cells that are then recruited to tissues. So to look at that, uh, we did an RNA-seq heat map and our number one candidate up there, and actually uh, Littman had done this and we got identical data basically, the closest I've ever seen on these kind of things. Uh, but serum amyloid A was our top hit uh, to be induced by SFB colonization. So serum amyloid A, and most of you have probably heard of it in some context or another. It's a serum apolipoprotein. It's known as an acute phase protein. It's elevated in a number of inflammatory diseases, obesity, RA, cardiovascular disease, asthma. It's been shown to drive Th17 and neutrophilic inflammation in the lung. And it can also drive IL-23 production by rheumatoid synovia sites. So we thought it was a pretty good candidate for driving this response and being released in the gut and traveling to the bone marrow. So we looked in the serum of these mice, and we found just in the baseline state that the mice that are colonized, the, these are the fecal transplanted mice, actually have an increase in the levels of serum amyloid A in their serum. So serum amyloid A is kind of a very promiscuous molecule. It can bind a number of different receptors, CD36, TOL2, TOL4, and uh, FPR2. And so we wanted to see whether there was any evidence for any one of those being upregulated perhaps in our cells. Is there some hint we could get without going through about 10 million knockout mice to figure this out? So what we did was uh, did some chromolent uh, chromatin remodeling experiments looking at CD36, TOL2, TOL4, and uh, this candidate FPR like one. And what we basically found that there was an open configuration around the transcription start site for the FPR like one molecule. But in fact, the CD36 was shut off and there were no changes in TOL2 or TOL4. So this seemed like a reasonable candidate to go after. What is this molecule? It, it's got a number of different names, but recently it's been classified as FPR2. It's a formal peptide receptor. It had been thought to uh, respond to formulated proteins from bacteria uh, when it was initially uh, described. It's chemoattractant for peripheral neutrophils, monocytes, and T cells, and it seems to mediate the chemotactic activity of serum amyloid or human phagocytic cells. So again, seems like a good candidate for us. We looked to see if serum amyloid um, induction of IL-23 in bone marrow cells was actually dependent on this pathway. And in fact, it, it is. We see that serum amyloid can induce IL-23 production from bone marrow cells, and that if you put a blocker, the WRW4 of the FPR2 pathway, it significantly suppresses IL-23 production. We've carried this further and done this blockade in a in vivo model of, of allergy, and the FPR2 pathway can block all the aspects of the allergic response. So it, it ties those pieces together. I'm gonna see what my time is here. Um, Getting back to the point where we could transfer the DCs and the only difference in them was is the gut colonization. We wanted to see if in fact uh, something, serum amyloid or one of the factors from the gut in colonization could alter bone marrow progenitor cells because that's where it would be having to occur if this was some endogenous change. And so to just briefly remind you, the the cells we're interested in, the dendritic cells, the monocytes, are deriving from the GMP population in the hematopoietic uh, cascade. But we looked at several paths along this pathway, and we see that, in fact, the taconic mice have higher numbers of GMP progenitors in the bone marrow. With no treatments whatsoever, this is just simply taking the mice off the shelves. So there's a direct effect on these populations, and it actually is at the expense of the platelet and red blood cell counts. 
So there's a real ramping up of the DC monocyte pathway in the bone marrow. And I'm not showing you the data here, but this persists for quite some time. So the mechanism we think for this at the moment is that um, the serum amyloid is driving an increase in the GMCSF receptor because the transition from the, uh, the progenitors to a dendritic cell population requires GM GMCSF. And we see here that if you take the non-colonized mice and colonize them, you get increases in all the subunits of the uh, GMCSF receptor. So it seems to be driving that population through enhancing the receptor expression on these cells. And I'm going to skip through a couple of these others because uh, I want to tell you one thing at the end here. So, so far we know that gut colonization with SFB can enhance the allergic response through an IL-17 mediated process. It appears to be associated with elevated serum am amyloid levels, which I've shown you can alter the bone marrow set point in terms of production of monocyte macrophages that can then be recruited to any number of tissues. Now in our model, we're recruiting them to the lung because of our allergen, but the relevance to your models in autoimmunity may be that those same populations can be recruited to any number of other tissues, skin, uh, liver, et cetera, heart, now, the one thing that we don't know is we do have evidence that that population, the receptor is upregulated and the numbers are enhanced, and that the IL-23 shift is dependent on this FPR2 pathway. The piece that we're missing here is we're not sure if the serum amyloid or another factor drives the upregulation of that FPR2 expression in these cells, and that that is what leads to the IL-23 shift. What we do know is that the CD11C positive cells seem to be producing the IL-23, and the CD11B positive cells are making the IL-10. So there's this balance, and the, the serum amyloid shifts that balance to the CD11C positive cells, thereby producing IL-23. So we still have many pieces here, but I think this has relevance to many diseases outside of asthma. And I wanted to share with you one um, interesting finding here and, and a source of frustration for my lab. So most of these studies I've shown you were done by a single graduate student in Cincinnati right before moving here. So I've got labeled up here Children's Hospital in Cincinnati and then Hopkins. So we ordered the Taconic and Jackson mice. Taconic, uh, Jackson on the left, Taconic on the right too. And you can see that they're dramatic, even if you don't know what these populations are, the Deconic and Jackson are very different from the get-go, all right? But they're a little bit different between uh, receiving them in Cincinnati versus receiving them here. Not dramatically, but somewhat, okay? So all the studies that we have done here, we cannot reproduce this phenotype unless we measure it on one day of being in this facility. Okay, that's it. Past one day, they're converted to some other phenotype. So what we have seen is that if the mice from that ordered in here are in this facility for three weeks, they completely change their uh, gut uh, microbiota. And one thing I don't have room to show you here is that it changes every single week. For it, we've only gone out to five weeks. Every week, this population changes, which is terrifying if you're doing mouse experiments, that this is changing so dramatically. But basically what this shows you is that the, the Jackson are the ones that are protected from the severe asthma, and the taconics are more susceptible. So the general gist is the firmicutes, which was also found in humans to be the increasing population with a t a susceptibility to allergic disease. We replicated that here, but what happens here when we lose this phenotype is there's a balance between the firmicutes and the bacteroides. So when that balance is established, our phenotype is gone. So a little frustrating because we can't continue to figure out the mechanisms of what's doing that here, 
Uh, but we think that this is going to tell us something probably important. And we're breaking down each of these groups to see exactly which uh, bacterial species are driving this and which are protective and which are actually uh, pathogenic in terms of TH17 immune responses. Uh, but one thing, a take home from this is control your experiments as tightly as you can, the number of days they've been in your facility, uh, so that you can at least reproduce what, what you're looking at. And it might explain differences from different labs that people can't explain, have just gone unexplained for many years. And that's kind of comforting, but it's not comforting when they change from week to week. Uh, so, you know, which facility is better or worse? Who knows? Uh, but one thing here is that in these bottom ones from Hopkins here, we cannot colonize these mice with SFB. They will not colonize, whereas they're easily colonized in, in the Cincinnati uh, facility. Uh, what I'm not showing here is in the firmicutes, there's a huge expansion of lactobacillus. And what's driving that, I'm not sure, but the, it's, it's overwhelming. It's almost the majority, majority of the firmicutes here. So there's a particular species that seems to dominate here, and it's uh, been giving us a, a little bit of a headache to sort it out. But uh, the, the ultimate question here is, is this important to humans at all? And SFB, because it's not culturable, has never really been looked at in clinical disease because we always just look at things we can culture, right? You can't culture this. You can't find it in cultures. There's a recent study where they've just taken samples from a number of humans, all different ages, and they only find it in humans under the age of three. Consistent with what I told you about it being an early colonization of bacteria, and it's not present in adulthood. That goes along with the childhood, uh, the importance of childhood in development or susceptibility to many of these inflammatory diseases. So our results suggest that, that early conditioning is critical to determining whether you have good Th17 immune responses or maybe overzealous. TH17 immune responses. And it's dependent on the genetics of the uh, background of the person. In our model, you have to have a TH2 response to see this, but it's in combination with that TH2. And so it suggests it may be relevant to other uh, inflammatory diseases like autoimmune diseases and that increase that you see in the developing world. One thing that they noted between these two suppliers was the diet and the preparations that they used to feed the mice. So there are clearly things to explore there in terms of explaining why you can get SFB colonization in one facility and not another. So many things to, to look at there. So I'd like to stop there and acknowledge uh, this is my group here when we just moved to Cincinnati going to the baseball game. Uh, but Stage C. Burgess was the student who did the majority of this, with the exception of uh, the latter part, where we're trying to sort out what's going on with uh, the microbiome here at, uh, at Hopkins. But thank you, and I'll stop there. It is. Uh, there are recombinant forms. The problem with using something like that, a protein, is you just can't keep the levels high enough. You know, we don't know if you could just give a single shot of it and, and be able to change these things. In vitro, we can drive these responses with the serum amyloid. But in vivo, I'm, I'm not sure, you know, we'd have to have a pump and a long-term delivery, I think, to keep the levels high enough. But. Uh, there is a knockout mouse we've been trying to get unsuccessfully so far, but yes. So there is something different about the gut of the infants mm -hmm. who are susceptible to infant botulism oh. uh, with clostridium. Hmm. Uh, so you do not feed honey to infants because hmm. honey may contain spores. I see. Uh, Whereas older children or adults are not susceptible mm -hmm. to 
Well, I suspect, and based on some of Jeff Gordon's work, that, it, that they're tending to identify what they call the mature microbiome with healthy, normal infants. And there's a whole spectrum of bacteria that make up that, what they're labeling as healthy. And they've looked at infants in the third world and those that are malnourished and, and have other issues in that, that normal progression is completely messed up. And they showed even with dietary supplementation, you can't entirely correct that. So it is critical, there's a critical window at which that needs to develop. And I, what I think we're adding to that is that that colonization is also critical for the normal development of the immune system, particularly in the bone marrow populations. So I, I agree, it's quite fascinating that there's that critical window of susceptibility to many things that, that seems to track with some of the uh, microbiome studies. Was I able to show that Control for it and show that if you colonize the checks on animals, there would be that increase in the dendritic We see the same thing. I just didn't have time to put that mm -hmm. slide so in here. But it's, it's anytime the SFB is present. Mm -hmm. So it suggests the SFB is doing something to either upregulate that receptor or something in the pathway that's needed for it to express itself. And we're trying to tease that out right now. Thank you so Good much. question. We have a half an hour of yeah. break and then I would like to introduce our uh, uh, second to last speaker. Um, this is Dr. Jobert Barin, uh, who started here at uh, John Hopkins after his graduation of his bachelor degree as a technician in neurosis lab, and later went uh, for a graduate studies and finished PhD in 2010. And he follows in the same lab because uh, you know there was nothing better that he could find uh, with postdoctoral fellowship and staying uh, as a uh, research associate junior faculty now. He already has over 15 publications in the uh, uh, area of autoimmune diseases, and he's starting a new hot topic on um, microbiome and the uh, role in the uh, heart inflammation. So welcome, Joe Burton, please. Thank you for that very kind introduction. After years of um, you know, sitting in the audience, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an immense privilege to actually be up here in front of, of all of you for once. All right, so we'll be talking about the commensal microbiome, and I have the luxury of being able to write on Dr. Wills Karp's um, spectacular coattails in terms of introducing how, how that works. So let's actually um, talk about some of, of, of what we talk about uh, when we talk about the microbiome. So the microbiota, as a general rubric, we, we, we constantly also refer to it as the gut flora more traditionally, but it consists of the totality, so all of the microorganisms that reside on and in us, um, whether we're healthy, whether in disease states. Uh, it's been estimated, and these are sort of ballparks, that the number of cells that actually reside, again, the gut is, is of course, the, the most extensive environment that these microorganisms live in, outnumber our own cells by about a factor of 10. But when you multiply that out by, by the genome that those, those microorganisms represent, and we're not just talking eubacteria, there are also, there's also colonization by eukarya, I'm sorry, by, by eukaryotes as well as archaea, viruses. Um, the number, the genes that are encoded by this microbiota outnumber our own genomes by, it's estimated at least a factor of 150. So there's this immense shadow genome that, that follows us with, essentially from birth, right? Um, so why study mucosal immunology to begin with? It turns out that, okay, for, for those of us who have been sort of classically trained, we think of circulation and lymphoid organs. It, it, is, it turns out that actually mucosal surfaces are our largest immune, immune or organ. Um, the enteric, uh, the alimentary canal, right, once you, if you lay it out end to end for a normal human adult, and I'm a little below average, but will run up to about eight meters, right? And if you unfold and unspool that, it's estimated that the surface area ranges from somewhere between 100 to 200 times the actual surface area. So approximately, and this ballpark estimate is still being, being debated, the gut actually represents probably more than at least half of, of, of our immune system. And it's also enriched for a bunch of cells that we tend to think of as 
classical immunologists as relatively rare subsets, cells like gamma delta cells, B1 cells, um, innate lymphoid cells, um, NKs and NKTs, which we think of as rare, are, 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 are enriched in the gut. So file that away for later because it, it, it's going to be important. Um, I won't spend too much time talking about the mi human microgene, um, mi sorry, the, 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 the human microbiome project, if only to indicate that we're just now beginning to be able to understand the incredible diversity with which we see here in, 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 in this cohort, it happened to be sort of healthy Western controls, but also um, with, with relationship to geography and location, diet, all manner of, 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 of variables. So let's actually uh, talk about the, the myocarditis model that, that, that we employ in the lab, uh, which we've used for, for a, a large number of years. We tend to think of it as a model of post-infectious autoimmunity in humans as well as animal modeling. The story that's emerged from the laboratory over the course of decades at this point, um, indicating that a, a really large and diverse group of, of uh, of, 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 an, of infecting agents. Here it's indicated as virus, but the list is enormous. It includes not only virus, but also bacteria, fungi, a large number of cardiotoxic drugs. Um, sort of a fun anecdote, a tangential point, a lot of them happen to be enteric, which have a secondary tropism for heart, so I'll file that little fun detail away in the back of your head. We think of autoimmunity as a sort of, what are these, uh, what processes do these share? We think of autoimmunity as sort of a convergent process that's necessary for coupling these, these infectious etiologies to further downstream, and I'm not really getting the pointer here, unfortunately, um, to further downstream cardiac remodeling, deleterious um, cardiac remodeling that winds up resulting in heart failure, which we commonly describe as a dilative phenotype. So for our purposes, because we're mostly interested, largely interested, oh, thank you. Yeah, it's okay, thank you though. Um, we tend to think of, uh, the, of, of, of this autoimmune intermediate as the sort of necessary convergent factor, and we oftentimes will, will at least for purposes of animal modeling, will skip the viral or infective etiology of the disease by directly immunizing with cardiac antigens, which um, I'm depicting in a little more detail here. So you'll notice that the strains of mice up here that um, I'm showing you aren't as common for a lot of other models. They tend to be A and C strain white mice, right, albinos, um, AJ, I've highlighted BALB Cs because we tend to use those most commonly in the laboratory. Um, we also have minimal synthetic peptides derived from cardiac autoantigens to be able to, to, to model these in a little more mechanistic detail. So we know from years of, of work that CD4 T cells are absolutely critical for the disease process. And it immediately implies that CD4 T cell differentiation, a subset of them, and a, by extension, a cytokine product of those cells is similarly necessary for, for the disease process. Now, um, in the interest of time, I've concatenated now a, a bunch of years of very excellent work by various students and fellows in the laboratory, but we know at this point that Th17 cells, which we've talked about extensively in here over the years, are critically important for this process. Without the Th17 program, for Animals are largely protected from disease. Now, this isn't to say that Th1 or Th2 cells don't participate in the disease process, and we've also published on several variants of the model over the years in which the Th1 and Th2 programs also participate. Okay, so Dr. Wills Karp, of course, gave a, a very excellent introduction to the segmented filamentous bacteria. So these bugs, um, again, colonized taconic mice, but not Jackson mice, and seem to be associated with, with just sort of native steady state turnover of Th17 cells in the mouse gut. So clearly, it, they make an, a, an attractive potential. Um, this actually is depicting the original electron microscopic um, characterization of these bugs dating from 1974. Um, represent a, a clear and attractive potential initial target for describing why a, um, why some mice may be more susceptible to disease more so than others. So uh, let's actually go ahead and skip that. To show, um, we can essentially replicate what, what Dan Littman sees, that when we source balb mice, so these are our susceptible animal strain, from taconic farms, they, we can see the presence of SFB by, by, by PCRing out SFB genome from, from their fecal, 
from their feces. And that's not true when we, when, when we do the same thing with mice that were sourced from the Jackson laboratories. And similarly, to essentially recapitulating what Dan Littman showed, this also associates with the turnover, with um, baseline production of interleukin-17 from the CD4 compartment in the taconic mice, but not in the Jackson animals. Right? So our disease is TH17-centered. SFBs seem to be tightly coupled to TH17 turnover. What happens when we induce disease? And much to our surprise, it is backwards. The Jackson mice develop more severe disease. And you can see these over here on the, on the far left. Those would be the, the, the blue um, diamonds as opposed to the um, taconic animals, which, were, which, which are over here in red. So surprising, right? Is it possible that the SFBs have a, exert a protective effect in our myocarditis model. So because we built this particular experiment from an SFB forward hypothesis, we happened to include some groups in this experiment to be able to start to address that. So it, first, if we forcibly colonize Jackson mice with taconic microbiota, their disease does not get less severe. Now similarly, if we treat the taconic animals with antibiotic to try and eliminate the SFB, their disease doesn't get more severe. So, so far this does not support SFBs exerting any role, protective or pathogenic, in, in our particular model. Um, we also have gone on to uh, demonstrate here, these are homogenates from, from diseased hearts, um, interrogated by, by multiplex cytokine assay, uh, uh, we still see a, a TH17 associated cytokine signature within these diseased hearts. Again, increased levels, normalized to wet heart weight in the Jackson animals, more so than the taconic animals. So this brings us back to sort of a, a fundamental ontologic problem. The disease is TH17 centered. However, at least at steady state, uh, SFB colonization is associated with, with, with the native turnover of TH17 cells. And this is, this is a fundamental disjoint. Is it possible that maybe the commensal coupled susceptibility resides within some other compartment. So we've gone through paneling through a, a whole bunch of, other, of, of various populations trying to look for something that might be commensal sensitive but tracks with disease susceptibility because CD4s don't. One of the emerging stories that's been, that's been coming out over in recent years seem to be uh, these cells that have been termed innate lymphoid cells, a rel relatively loose and generic umbrella to describe cells with the lymphoid lineages that don't bear canonical antigen receptors. So they're not a T cell, they don't have the receptor. They're not a B cell because they don't have that receptor. Um, NK cells, if you want to, to envision the natural killer cell, have since been subsumed into this model as sort of a prototype for understanding that they, they, they exert mostly innate defense functions, even though they bear seemingly ontologic relationships and developmental relationships relationships with the rest of the lymphoid lineages. So we went looking for, for, for signs of ILCs, not just in the guts, but also the hearts of, of our animals. So this is staining from um, naive animals at Jackson's, but it, that doesn't necessarily matter. And we know um, from, from, from plenty of other people's work, and we're able to essentially re recapitulate that the ILC3 population that seems to be sort of a, imagine it, uh, the ILCs as kind of like a symmetric parallel universe to, to CD4 T cells. There are flavors that seem to be be associated with the Th1 and Th2 and Th3, um, sorry, IL7, uh, Th17 programs, but, but without antigen specificity. And what we see over here being that in the gut, there are plenty of Th17 cells. However, in the, the heart, so these are naive hearts, there are still cells that bear markers of the ILC phenotype. Here, I'm showing them as, as not being um, type one or type three, um, staining from one of our students in the laboratory, Nicola Dini, who isn't here today, she's at the Gordon Conference, actually has been able to demonstrate that actually most of the heart resident ILCs seem to be type two, so TH2 associated ILCs. We look into the heart, into the, into, I'm sorry, into the ILC compartments of Jackson and taconic animals, specifically in the ileal lamina propria, and this tracks with disease susceptibility. There are more ILC3s, so TH17, IL17 producing associated inter innate lymphoid cells in the guts of Jackson mice, but not taconic animals. So is this the only difference that we see? Let's actually skip on ahead to one of the other models that we can employ in, in, in contrast to comparing Jackson and taconic animals. Is it possible, you know, do, does, do commensal microbiota have any role in 
precipitating disease susceptibility. So we've turned to the poor man's germ-free animal, and that's treating animals with, with, with a cocktail of antibiotics, commonly used throughout the microbiome literature, so you know, dozens of, of papers, use this cocktail of an ampicillin, metronidazole, neomycin, and vancomycin, and there's a few um, labs that, that also optionally add in gentamicin. So what happens if we treat Jackson animals with the antibiotic cocktail, their disease gets less severe. So here, over on the far left, it's the total number of CD45 leukocytes that we can enumerate by, by cytometry. Um, their hearts are less enlarged. This is at, at peak of disease at day 21. And then the severity of the cardiac infiltrates over here on the right also, also diminishes. Um, and very importantly, when we, when we, when we, when we assess the cardiac function, uh, assess the function of these diseased hearts, these animals are protected from progressing to heart failure. This is echocardiographic imaging, which you know, not everyone here may necessarily be as familiar with, but over on the right, these are M modes. So, so taking one dimension of axis through the left ventricle and then being able to use that to measure a variety of, of cardiofunctional parameters, um, essentially to calculate out that these animals aren't, aren't, aren't entering heart failure. So, uh, it, and consistent with this, we've, we're, we're able to, to, to see less transcription of, of fibrosis-associated transcripts in the heart following, following, following antibiotic treatment um, by a variety of different measures. So, mechanistically, does this still couple with the SFB-independent story that we see in the Jackson versus Taconic comparison? Um, not unlike the Jackson versus Taconic comparison, we see... Um, no real specificity in, in, in the infiltration of, of these hearts with, with, with Th17 or Th1 cells. Everything seems to be diminished because the hearts are just less inflamed. But there's no selectivity for being just the Th17 or just the Th1 subset. We have observed, though, that when we look into now the guts of naive, so not disease-induced, antibiotic-treated animals, of the differences we do see, we actually see limited expression of the Th17 associated chemokine receptor CCR6. And this also seems to, to track very specifically with its cognate ligand, the, the chemokine CCL20, suggesting that that may be a mechanism by which antibiotic or potentially, the, if not the dysbiosis induced by antibiotic, then the germ free state limits the susceptibility of, of, of animals to disease. So let's see, let's skip on ahead in the interest of time. We've gone ahead and started um, assaying out the, the in, in, by, by, by pyrosequence methods, the community profiles in which these animals are, are colonized with. Here, um, this is a very small limited preliminary um, um, data set that, that, that we've been pulled through, but we're essentially able to recapitulate things that other people have seen, that Jackson animals, their commensal microbial um, colonization profiles segregate away from those from taconic. And depending on the methodologies we use, we're also able to see a shift during the immunization process. Um, so right now, it's a little rough to be able to start to pick out individual, individual um, taxa. So this actually, um, this particular uh, representation, I can spin this all kinds of different ways, um, picks out the, ver the, the various differences in, 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 in microbiota that we're hoping to be able to slim down, not just by adding more N, but also to, by adding more variations and permutations, antibiotic, germ freeze, potentially adding in other sources of, of, of valb animals. Um, with, with the eventual hopes of being able to, to isolate specific monocolon, um, specific taxa that we can then spike back by monocolonization um, to, to demonstrate pathogenic pathogenicity. So um, unfortunately, it's still an unfinished story. We're hoping to be able to you know, tell you more about with more, with more definitive detail in the future. We have a variety of mechanisms that we're, we're, we're still are still associative at for, at for right now that. Uh, we hope to be able to, to address in, in more detail in the very near future. So with that, um, even though we don't have an extensive amount of, uh, of data as to what which of these many postulated mechanisms throughout, throughout disease processes might, might be involved, I'd like to leave you with this tantalizing idea that, of, that the microbiota um, intimately and, and and, and tightly associate with, with, with our own disease and health, not just immunologically, but metabolically, in complex networks that we're just now begin, beginning to understand. <laughs>
So I have to recognize not just the members of the of of the rest of the of the Rose Laboratory, Daniela and and Dr. Rose, in, especially, but also under the larger rubric of of of, of the Autoimmune Disease Research Center, uh, as well as our collaborating and, and technical assistance laboratories over here on the right, in particular, the contributions of Daniel Peterson, um, our, our resident microbiologist, who's been able to contribute very dramatically to the to the microbiome um, understanding in the lab. I'd be happy to take any questions. So we've not actually gotten yet to assay that, either in the diseased heart, but it's actually that experiment is immediately in the hopper once we clear a few re repeats of, of, of these. But we are very interested in, in looking into, especially um, with Dr. Wills Karp's uh, investigations of, of, of distal myeloid populations. It's something we're very keen to be doing very soon. Mm -hmm. Thinking specifically of a Zekaya, I, I remember very dramatically. Mm -hmm. Sure, sure, sure. Um, we've we've not had an opportunity to address those innate humoral pathways. Um, you know, when we say the you know bringing up the large umbrella of innate immunity can be any any measure of things cellular both myeloid and and, and lymphoid um, we have been initially attracted to the innate lymphoid compartments and not just the ILCs but also you know to a lesser extent say gamma deltas in no small part because we know they're there and we also know that at least some of the populations reside within the native the naive heart we're part of the sort of underlying um, thematic that, that, that we've not been able to address directly just yet, but we have you know, great interest in trying, trying to approach is how things that happen very distally at the gut, how is it that they couple to something that happens somewhere else? So a, a very similar theme to, to what you've been able to address. We're hoping to be able to, to contribute to that soon. Anyone? All right. Oh, come on. In the disease model or in the or in commensal dependent coupling to the autoimmune process? Yeah, we actually have not, we've, we've I can actually show what we have been able to, to see. When we look into the, uh, actually now that I think about it, I don't have cytokines staining for, for those, but everything is diminished. Um, at a cellular level, when we look for total interferon gamma, um, it actually doesn't seem to, to, to map over as, 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 as substantially as the 17 signature that I'm showing here. So that doesn't mean they're, they're not there or they're, they're, not, they're not participating. They just don't seem to, to, to rise up as a, as, as a very significant difference. We do know that interferon gamma and Th1 cells can induce elicit and elicit some measure of myocarditis through adoptive transfer models and, and various permutations of the system o over the years, but that disease does not seem to be as severe as the Th17-associated disease. Thank you. All right, thank you.